Okay, I'm calling it to order. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Uh, welcome to the uh, quarterly meeting of Pennsylvania's State System of Higher Education Board of Governors. Um, we want to extend that welcome to everybody who is in here today. And we want to let you know that today's meeting is going to focus on better understanding uh, the journey that our students take to reach their higher education goals and how we can help them succeed in that journey. So during the course of uh, this time, we are also going to do breakout sessions so that we can dive deeper into the five system redesign teams that are focused on student success. Uh, again, that's a departure from a normal board meeting, but something we have done in the past um, because we, we truly believe that we're privileged enough to be together as a board and have our presidents here uh, and others. Let's all work together uh, and make it a meaningful time. Um, so these are critically important conversations uh, for us as a board so that we can understand how we can support the work that's underway. Um, and just to let you know, tomorrow we'll include committee meetings for the university success and the governance and leadership standing committees, followed by our full board meeting uh, to take care of our regular business. And so now I think uh, it is my privilege to turn this part of the meeting over to Vice Chair David Mazur, who is chair of the Student Success Committee. Uh, thank you. Are these... I always get confused. So we're, we're now back to our old fashioned mics that are only live when we actually turn them on. It was a joy in our last board meeting that every mic was live the whole time. Thank you, Kutztown. <laughs> I don't know where we're going. Do we know where we're going next October? But I would like to no formally like, request no, no that we don't have live mics next October to whichever one of the 12 of you is fortunate enough to play host to us. <laughs> So thank you, Cindy. Thank you for your leadership. And uh, thank you as we continue to navigate the important issues that will help advance our efforts to transform the state system. Uh, we are going to begin because we are, this is an official meeting. So can we please begin with a roll call vote? Audrey, would you please call the roll? Audrey is not Oh, there, oh, there you she are. Is. Sorry, you're not in Audrey. Uh, in the Audrey you're not in your usual perch, which I see is without electronics. So I'm assuming you're in a better position. So thank you, Audrey. You're welcome. Governor Avon Biddinger. Here. Representative Tim Briggs. Governor Audrey Bronson. Vice Chair David Mazur. Present. Governor Mary Moskowitz. Here. Secretary of Education, Pedro Rivera. Designee, Noah Ortega. Here. Chair, Cynthia Shapira. Here. Chair, Dave, David Mazur, you have a quorum. Thank you. Um, the Student Success Committee, uh, it's pretty straightforward. We're focused on ensuring all students have access to college. They complete in a timely manner with a path forward that leads to individual fulfillment and career success. Our scope as a committee is focused on the policies and strategies that will support the universities in enabling student access and success. Understanding the student experience and the support structures that ensure success is part of our focus and will culminate in big ticket outcomes such as student retention, deep learning, college completion, and career success. We're excited about our committee meeting today, which will focus at a very high level on system redesign, specifically our approach to implementation and to accountability for and measures of system redesign success. Following the system redesign update from Rosa Lara, we will do a deeper dive into how system redesign is helping us build a framework for student success. This time, Sarah Bowder will lead us through some critical inflection points in a student's journey from recruitment through completion and into the workforce, and will bring us up to date on the student success redesign teams are doing to support effective interventions at critical points, and we look forward to that as well. We will then move into breakout sessions to allow you all to learn more about relevant data. Uh, this is not your typical breakout, so uh, please bear with us for a little while because we are doing something a little unusual today. And, um, we will work through those teams. We do believe it will be a good use of your time. 
So in order to get us started, I'd like now to turn the program over to Rosa Lara to provide the latest system redesign update. Rosa? Thank you. So I think Dan wanted to provide some opening remarks to set the stage for uh, system redesign. So that's great. Um, can you, or who has the clicker? Here. Oh, thank thank you. Oh, I can't do anything until I... I actually appreciated Kutztown's leaving live because it forced discipline in the way we manage. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thank you, President Hawkins. <laughs> uh, so thank you. I wanted to um, just a couple of remarks on the, the why, what, and how of system redesign. Just so if we have, if we in case we'd forgotten to ground us. Um, so there's. I love this chart because every time we show, it, we just move that blue bar. And that is evidence of progress, Madam Chair. <laughs> Uh, and vice chair. So, um, so anyway, there's the we're we're fully into uh, really the implementation <coughs> phase, having spent quite a bit of time on uh, review and planning. So, if we go quickly to the next slide, so this is um, we're going to do this continually now through the board presentations. These are issues that we want to discuss with the board, um, where we really appreciate feedback, and you'll see this throughout this slide deck. We'll put those issues for consideration up front. And then they'll come back again at the end of the session or the section. Um, so these are the kinds of things um, uh, that uh, we're, we're looking at here. Um, uh, we're going to talk about the why, what, and how. That's the brief uh, introduction. And then uh, Rose is going to take us through the implementation planning. And then, um, and then we're going to show off what we think we're going to be doing with respect to how we hold ourselves accountable collectively across our, our university for our performance. Um, so if we just go to the next slide. So, you know, just uh, again, a quick reminder, you know, why system redesign? Well, you know, it's because our mission is really sustainable, affordable, relevant post-secondary education to all Pennsylvanians um, as an engine of social mobility and economic development. It's as simple as that. Um, obviously, as the world changes, we need to change within that world. Um, and, and so keeping our eye on that prize, that being our goal. The priorities that we identified, you know, over the course of our planning process, well, obviously we have to stabilize the system financially. That's pretty important. That's a near and pressing and really immediate concern. But the longer term, the longer term, really, it's is to equip our universities to continue to serve our students as their needs change and our employers as their needs change and our communities as their needs change in a rapidly changing world. And there's some of the things that we've decided that we need to work on initially with the board when we decided on what are we going to, what are the things we care about where we want to measure our success. And as we then went in to set up the system wide redesign teams, those are the kind of issues that they are focused. Um, and obviously, you know, our approach is to leverage our, our, our collective strength, our, 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 our um, uh, the fact that we are uh, a single entity of, of uh, which is 10 or 12,000 strong in our staff and our faculty and 96,000 strong in our students. At that size, there's on, almost nothing we cannot do. Um, so the why of system redesign, this is, uh, for those of you who uh, have the good fortune of not working in the Office of the Chancellor, this is what we refer to as our layer cake slide. It's the, you know, the five areas where we're operating in order to deliver against those goals shown on the previous slide. They're all important, they're all related. Uh, with going through each of those, uh, each of the uh, work in each of those areas is intended to achieve our financial stabilization and then ultimately to continue our university's transformation in service to the Commonwealth. Um, we've spoken at length about them. They're shown here in abbreviated form uh, with uh, the portfolio on the left, strengthening uh, governance and accountability, building a shared infrastructure, et cetera, and the sort of high level goals we'd expect to see from that uh, on the right. So that's the what of our system redesign. And this is a uh, sort of what's beginning uh, through our experience, and I think we've already all, always known, our understanding that the systems redesign, our success is a shared accountability. And this is an important kind of concept that we're all, I think, beginning to grapple with, our faculty, our staff, our employees, the board, that this is no longer a responsibility of the system office. This is no longer just a responsibility of the presidents or, or, or a, it's our collective responsibility. All of us have a role to play. And the things that we have managed to accomplish, even in our first real sort of a aggressive planning year around this, we've managed to accomplish them because we've worked really well together. That doesn't mean we've always agreed with each other, but it means that we've managed to, to, to flesh out the challenges and issues and to come up with solutions. We're all recognizing our distinctive roles. Just a couple of examples of things on our horizon to kind of make that point concretely. Um, we're having a conversation with some geoscientists, geoscientists 
about doing some really cool academic, you know, educational programming for high need individuals, you know, in areas that would lead directly to job short course certificate stuff. This is an initiative that has kind of come up from individuals, right? But for it to succeed, it requires universities to, you know, engage in a way that supports those individuals doing that work. And the system is going to have to clear a path, right? Because there's some things that need to happen for a shared academic program to work. So all of us have a collective responsibility in making that work. Sustainability planning was, you know, a really uh, an effort where we put ourselves on the path where our, our universities are and beginning to think really carefully and creatively about how to get themselves on a financially sustainable footing. That conversation has been going on for months and it has involved input at each of those levels. Its success will be our <coughs> responsibility. And this is a hard thing for us to do move to a point where that is their problem, that is their issue, that is their responsibility. This is our issue, this is our responsibility. What works well is when we lean in together, negotiate the challenges, find plausible paths forward. What works um, badly, and it happens sometimes, is where we hear people say, oh, well, that's neighbor University, that's their problem, or that's the chancellor's office, or well, that's those, those people over there. These, these, these issues are challenging for them to work. They involve and engage all of us. So as we begin to think in this third section about our accountability, how we hold ourselves accountable, we're trying to build an accountability framework that operates at all three of those levels. So we'll begin to see, uh, we'll see that slide sometimes with more words on it uh, in the course of the next uh, bit. <coughs> I think that was my bit, but if you go to the next slide, Rosa. I knew it. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, Dan. Just so, in case anyone was worried, we have three hours to get through all of this. So Dan adding all of that, we'll probably only finish in three and a half. <laughs> <laughs> I was controlling myself. My script was much more. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. So during this part of the presentation, it'll be delivered in two parts. Uh, during my part, I'll talk about the system redesign implementation plan that we've been working uh, through over the past year the approach we took, the initiatives, how we've structured the plan. And Kate Akers, the director of the advanced analytics team, is going to talk about an evaluation framework that we've conceptualized to evaluate ourselves against the plan. <coughs> Before I begin, I do want to take a moment to thank all of the university participants that have um, been involved throughout this entire year of, of uh, system redesign planning. We had um, over 100 participants across various disciplines, all working actively uh, across a variety of teams to, to, to help contribute to this plan. As I walk through the plan, these are some questions for you to think about. Uh, first, does the approach that we're talking about make sense to you? Does it provide you the overview that you need as board members? Is the plan's representation giving you enough detail, too much detail? And does it support your discussion of near and long-term priorities? <coughs> Me. So this graphic um, provides you a structural view into how we've um, assembled the plan. Each of the layers that Dan referenced has specific goals and outcomes that we're trying to achieve from a system redesign perspective. We refer to those layers as portfolios. Within each portfolio, we've identified specific initiatives that will contribute to meeting those um, outcomes. And then that's all feeding into a master work plan. From a planning perspective, we're able to track milestones, dependencies at the initiative level, at the portfolio level, and at the overall master work plan level. The other thing I'll highlight is that as, as I go through my portion, you're going to hear about initiatives that might have been presented in prior board meetings. What we've done is taken a step back and make sure to make sure that there's alignment of everything that we're working on to these five pillars. So it was a really great exercise to make sure that we are organized and we're laser focused on meeting our objectives. In terms of the method of- May I ask a question? Oh, would you prefer questions at the end or? Sure, you can ask a question now. Okay, I presume there's sort of like a, an owner- and Can you just, five we, we've got like 42 people in this room. Can you just identify yourself oh, on I'm the sorry. phone? It's, yeah, I'm sorry, it's Jan Yeomans. Hi, Jan. <laughs> Hi. Um, uh, so there must be an owner for each of the five portfolios. Who owns the master work plan? Because somebody has to bring it all together to make sense to, to really align it with the system objectives. So the, the actual plan itself I'm managing, 
but I wouldn't say that I'm managing that on my own. There are owners for each of the initiatives, for each of the portfolios, and we're working together <laughs> to make sure that we're meeting mm -hmm. our objectives. Okay, but you're the one really who, who brings them all together <coughs> and, and assures that alignment is in place. Correct. Thank you. <coughs> so from a plan methodology perspective, we spent a lot of time thinking about short-term versus long-term outcomes with our initiatives and what we're trying to achieve. And we recognize for a number of initiatives that there are foundational processes, um, policies, structures in some cases, organizational structures, um, technology enablement that needs to be done before we can realize the more transformational goals and outcomes of redesign. So we've referred to that foundational um, body of work as wave zero. And you'll see that throughout, that some of these initiatives are really focusing on foundational items before we can get to um, the longer term outcomes. Uh, as I mentioned, each of the initiatives has milestones, deliverables, um, dependencies, um, all being tracked. We have success criteria for each of the initiatives and then evaluation measures. So we spent time thinking about how do we know that we're moving in the right direction? And that's going to be a large portion of Kate's talk. Through that process, um, we're going to use that to ensure that we are evaluating ourselves and course correcting if we need to. So this is how um, we are presenting the plan to you in summary form. Obviously, there's a lot more detail here. And I'll just orient you to the slide. Each of the green bars represents an initiative that is that we're working on. You see it's aligned by fiscal year and then by quarter in the fiscal year and then the, the short-term goals that we're trying to achieve within that portfolio. Uh, this specific portfolio is really about establishing governance frameworks, decision rights, and a set of enterprise management tools that all need to work together to make sure that we're managing the state system effectively. So um, you'll see various durations. Um, and, and what really the key takeaway here is that we want to, sorry, we want to iterate the use of all of these tools and governance mechanisms <coughs> throughout an entire fiscal year, just to take, be able to take a step back and make sure that we are, uh, we have the right tools, are working effectively, and we can make improvements to them if necessary. This next set of, uh, this next portfolio was the focus of the October board meeting, so I, I won't go into the initiatives in great detail, um, but as a reminder, it's focusing on the back office uh, infrastructure processes, policies that need to be put in place to enable a sharing system from an academic perspective, from a shared services perspective, and from an IT perspective. So some of the things that were talked about in prior board meetings are around the need for academic master planning at a system level or the need to establish the shared services um, uh, group to, to be in receipt of new shared services or the one sys was, was a topic of the last uh, board meeting. You'll see uh, that a number of the, sh of the goals outlined are are short-term in nature. We recognize that. There's certainly the long-term goal of realizing savings. But for, for many of these, we're going to need some foundational items before we can realize that. This third portfolio is focused on identifying initiatives that improve retention, completion, career readiness, and affordability. There's two streams of work here. The first is uh, on developmental education math. Uh, one of the redesign teams that was formed last year included multiple university participants to assess what the system was doing in this area and what techniques were being done for placement and what outcomes we were able to realize for students. And we saw that there was a lot of opportunity for improvement that was then matched against national best practice data. And the team made some, some really great recommendations that were put forward. It was fortunate that a grant opportunity was made available right as that team was ramping down. Uh, where a funder was looking for large state systems to invest in um, proving out some of those national best practices. And we were lucky enough to, to go after that grant funding. Uh, and now we're waiting to hear back to see if, if uh, we'll be able to test out some of those hypotheses. So it's a really nice full circle example of system redesign in action. And you'll, you'll hear more about this work. There's a, one of the breakout groups is focused on this topic. 
The other stream of work is related to student success and retention. Before the holidays, uh, four redesign teams were formed, focusing on holistic advising, financial aid and affordability, mental health and wellness, and workforce readiness. So we have university professionals uh, looking at this topic, assessing the current state, looking at national best practices, and we expect them to come forward with pilot opportunities that would be tracked and managed in this portfolio. And again, that's also going to be related to the work breakout groups that you'll hear about shortly. The fourth portfolio is focused on improving our organizational performance through employee engagement, satisfaction, talent recruitment, and development. Um, the main body of work here is around an, uh, an employee engagement survey that was issued to all state system employees. The results have come in, and you are going to see some of those findings during tomorrow's portion of the board agenda. So the next body of work is to develop action plans around those survey results to see how we can make improvements in terms of our employee engagement and satisfaction. So that's one, one uh, body of work. The second is related to developing a system-wide training and development strategy. We recognize that training is also a key component of, of employee satisfaction and retention. Um, additional planning and scoping is needed in this space. We didn't want to lose sight of it, so uh, we kept it here, but more to come on that topic. And then the last portfolio is focused on two main pieces of work. The first is on building an advocacy strategy so that stakeholders outside of the state system um, uh, uh, can understand the system redesign goals and, and journey. We can garner support for what we're trying to do and have that help improve not only getting additional investment into the system, but also helping pass the legislation that was recently introduced. The last body of work is just a continued strategic communications campaign to keep all stakeholders, both internal and external, informed as we progress through system redesign. So that's my portion of the presentation. I can pause for questions, or we can do them after Kate does her talk. Any questions now, Madam Chair? Thanks very much, Rosa. Really appreciate that. Um, very, very thorough. Uh, right, OK. <laughs> you got back to that, baby. OK. Um, uh, I, uh, you know, I think it is a good overview. Um, it is an overview, and and so you know, we'll we'll want more details as we get further into it. I did have a question specifically with regard to, uh, and, and you you might have commented on this, so repeat it if you did. But um, the uh, student success and retention initiative uh, just has a big TBD uh, with it. And so I'm just sort of wondering, and, and, and everything else seems to be at least a little more, I'm, I'm wondering why that isn't further along. It seems to me that's like of everything, one, at least one of the most, if not the most important. So I'm just wondering, you know, why the lag time there? Sure. So I'll, I'll give an answer, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to Sarah Bowder, who's over the four teams. Um, when we started the system redesign implementation, or planning teams, the the teams dedicated to those topics did not launch at the same time. So they, they were launched a little later, and so that's, that's partly why um, the, the, those recommendations have not been brought forward. So they just were formed right before the holidays and have, only have had a couple meetings. Um, but I'll, I'll let Sarah. Yeah, so of the four teams, part of it is that the uh, launch was delayed a little bit. I would say also that um, two of the, the subject, holistic advising and health and wellness, are very, very large topics with uh, great sensitivity. And so they're probably going to be delayed as we think uh, forward. The financial aid and affordability team is moving pretty quickly. Um, they have emerging themes already, <laughs> starting to look at definitions. So I anticipate... Um, we're going to have some deliverables uh, pretty quickly on that team. And then the workforce and career readiness is kind of in between that. There's some other activities that are uh, happening um, in, tan in um, parallel with that team that I think is going to help support uh, the movement there. So, I, you know, just to comment back, um, uh, 
uh, and, and maybe this is, you know, this is the way my head works. It's been a bee in my bonnet for, for years, but um, the holistic advising and, and the mental health and wellness, uh, that is critically important. I, I would urge us not to accept the fact that there's, quote, simply going to kind of be a delay in getting those out and think about how we can, you know, whatever the issue is, do we need to apply more resources to that team? You know, uh, I whatever might be, aside from sensitivities, I understand that, but um, uh, we, that, that's, with, with, without addressing that, I, I don't think our student success uh, outcomes can truly be addressed. So I would just urge us to think about whatever the barriers are uh, to moving forward very um, fulsomely with that. Um, the only other comment I wanted to make had to do with uh, the enhancing the culture and talent um, portfolio. Uh, has there been given any thought around the, the idea um, of hiring? So, we, you know, talking a lot about professional development and training, et cetera. Um, I, I think that there's a lot kind of in the, not that I'm an expert in this, but I am sort of dealing with this, you know, with other hats I'm wearing, uh, with, with the idea of, of how you hire in the first place, you know, when you have control over that. But uh, I, I think hiring is um, it's just an element that I would think about um, adding to that as we develop um, this, this initiative. And there are also lots of <coughs> best practices examples out there, you know, uh, like Disney, for example. Um, is known to be, you know, one of the best at hiring um, and, and supporting talent, et cetera. So I'm just hoping, you know, that we look for examples outside of uh, higher education when we're thinking about developing that module. Absolutely. I have a question. Well, first an observation that I have to agree with Cindy on the holistic advising and the mental health and emotional wellness. Those are two um, major issues that students have. I think that greatly impact them at the local level that when we have student governments, when we have to deal with issues, advising and, and mental health and emotional wellness are ones that are major impacts on students staying and succeeding at their time at the Pashi schools. But also, I, I have my question is, what is the comp composition of the uh, student success team? Who, who comprises that? What is their background? Yeah, so we have a broad range of um, members on each of the teams. They go across all of the campuses. Uh, many of them are subject matter experts. Um, and then others that are tangential but touch, you know, whether it's affordability. Um, so, and then they're bringing in some support groups um, and other uh, university experts to get voices at the table. Thank you. And they were, they were um, selected by the presidents, and so um, really quite pleased with, with who's involved. I think it's also interesting, it, worth pointing out that whatever, we're a, several months, almost a year in. Um, so we're in a position where we can begin to die, like what worked and what didn't. Yeah. And, and so we're actually beginning to have those conversations. We need to do it more holistically. You know, some teams just get off the ground. I mean, we've talked about developmental education, the investment team, the budget team. I mean, they just knock it out of the park. And, mm -hmm. and then other teams struggle to get started, to be perfectly honest. It's not about the personalities. It's about the, the teamness of it. And, and, and there's some there's probably lessons that we need to learn. It isn't necessarily clear to me that sort of team formation and launch is the kind of identikit, you know, wash, rinse, repeat model. You just it works well every time. And we'll, we'll have to figure that out. I mean, this is I mean, one of the interesting things about this journey is we're kind of learning how to do the journey as we're on it. Um, uh, and and uh, so um, it, I, it actually will get to the next section of the of the presentation. The accountability. One of the reasons to do accountability is obviously, OK, how are we doing? But the real reason to do it is to sort of breed that or internalize that sort of constant self-reflection, that sort of after-action debrief, what worked, what didn't, and how does it apply to our processes as well as to our sort of outcomes. So that's a great question. Madam Chair, may I just, uh, I think something, and I know you asked us to think about some questions, but one thing to, that is may become problematic because we're going to be discussing these kinds of accountability, accountability measures in the form of a boardroom where there's a number of folks who have different perspectives when they see initiatives. Uh, I want to make sure that we, what's not lost in the conversation is when we're talking about some of these initiatives, is at the system level and not the institutional level. This way there isn't a perception that I think mental health is a really important topic, but it's not to say that it's not being addressed at the institutional level by our leaders where it's needed the most. And I think that distinction is going to become blurred 
if we don't find a way to account for that, it may be in the form of an ecology of some sort, just to make sure that that, uh, that that isn't lost. Because I don't want people to walk away from these meetings thinking that it's not because the system did not develop an initiative, doesn't mean that the institutions aren't on it. That's great. And, and I want to, I, I just, in the interest of full transparency, I did not, we didn't plan this, Deputy Secretary and I did not get together and plan that question. <laughs> but that is, in effect, the essence of what is called inside the Office of the Chancellor the swirly slide, which shows the shared accountability of university system individual. Um, universities are doing great work in many of these areas. Individuals are doing great work in many of these areas. The system is doing you know, okay work in many of these areas. Um, but for this, to, for, the, for, for advising is the example on the table, but it could be any of the things we're talking about, for them to take root and to achieve a high level of scaled impact, it can't just be left to the individual, the university, or the system. We all have to figure out how to operate together. And it's that operating together, frankly, the secret sauce of system redesign to me is that. Absent that will be a, uh, it used to be a cabinet of curiosities and in innovation. Great. Thank you for the questions and the discussion. I'm now going to turn it over to Kate Akers. And yes, he wasn't kidding. We, we certainly didn't plan that, but that really leads us right into really just kind of some ideas that we have around an accountability framework. So the question really is how do we hold ourselves accountable? And then the we there, as you, as you just described, it's many different types of we. So if we go back to what we call that swirly slide that I'll get to in just a minute, um, thinking about these various levels um, will be really important as we think about the implementation plan for system redesign. So before we dive into that, um, some real issues for consideration. So knowing that we are, we're kind of bringing these pieces up together. So those of you that are familiar with an evaluation framework know the, the significance of that and the importance of that and really setting how will we hold ourselves accountable while we are also implementing so we can understand really what that North Star is. So I, I want to make sure and note that today. Um, so, so three of the, the main kind of questions that I want you to keep in the back of your mind, and then we'll, we will come back to those at the end of this kind of um, draft uh, framework. Are we aligned on our critical assumptions? So one of those assumptions is that swirly slide. So thinking about um, those levels of accountability um, and how they really work together. And then we have the question of, are we measuring the right things? Are, are, when we talk about accountability from an evaluation framework, are the metrics that we're looking at the ones that really are our guiding star? Um, or do we see any unintended consequences from identifying those specifically as our metrics? And then the last piece um, is one, one that, that, that we certainly struggled with, and it's thinking about assessing system redesign work on strengthening governance and accountability. So as we began to think about what some of those metrics were, and you'll see this a little bit later, they're, they're very qualitative, and which, which I think is, is, is a wonderful evaluation design, but really thinking about how do we really assess that that, that specific area in the layer cake um, is, is moving forward. Okay, so now back to where we were five minutes ago um, and thinking about this accountability framework. So in front of you, you see that same, the swirly slide, um, and thinking about these kind of three pieces. And I, I don't really think about it as different tiers, um, but really how they are all working together. Um, that's the, the swirl. So um, today we're going to talk a little bit about a draft evaluation framework. Um, and, and I really want to emphasize the word draft. I'm really looking forward to the discussion today and the feedback and thinking about, again, how all of these pieces go together. So we, we understand that the work that happens here um, within the Office of the Chancellor, for example, may not directly impact a student every day. Um, and so thinking about the different levels of accountability that are really needed to help us execute against that plan. So here you'll see in the gray, the system level um, and thinking about system level student and university success, system redesign and office of the chancellor and that shared, um, shared services performance. So those are the three areas that we're looking at for, at the system level. On the right-hand side in gold, we have the university level, um, which include student and university success and employee engagement. 
And then at the individual level, thinking about um, executive performance review and then non-executive review as well. So those items that are bolded today, which are primarily around um, our student level, um, our, our multi-level goals and the, the metrics that you all as a board affirmed, and then also thinking about system redesign and what specific metrics or indicators we need to assess that as we move forward. So as we move forward uh, in, the, in the presentation today, we're gonna talk about those pieces um, and, and also some of the, the progress um, that we've made on those, but also thinking about how we can relay that type of information to you on those board of firm metrics and thinking about different types of dashboards and ways that we can really demonstrate some of our progress, but also some of our challenges as we move forward. So diving right in, um, last January and then also in July, um, this board came together based on a lot of committee work and a lot of consultation and came up with a variety of different metrics um, to really, uh, really guide us in the work of system redesign and, and really just system wide. So we have those in two primary categories. First, we're going to talk about the student success indicators. So if you just look along the, along the top in the different colors, those are the, the high level indicators. How we've really operationalized those um, is then seen in the numbers below. And um, I, I couldn't talk about these indicators without giving a lot of credit right now to, to our university presidents, to their staff that have worked um, endless hours on, on the goal template work. So through this goal setting process that they're now doing, and we'll talk a little bit more how this fits in. In Rosa's slide, it was in the enterprise management tool section thinking about how we can really do strategic planning at a university and a system level that really pushes on these indicators. So the, the indicators across the top, enrollment, credit completion ratio, retention rates, um, graduation or completion, earnings threshold, and student affordability. So those are the ones that really push um, in the student success category. Now you'll notice some different colors um, on there and maybe a different heading. As we look through the work of system redesign and thought about it, and, and you know, we're hearing comments from universities, we identified um, some gaps that we saw based on actually going through and pulling out various metrics. So um, some of those metrics um, are just additions. And then one is a little bit of a change in framework. So the, the word completion instead of just graduation. So the idea would be that completion um, would be the overarching category. And then underneath completion, we would have our graduation metrics, um, but we would also add in um, new criteria, new goals um, aligned to total credentials awarded. So degrees, non-degree credentials, and non-credit non credentials. So um, really putting an emphasis on, on not just seeing this type of information, but also collecting it. These are the areas that, that we at the Office of the Chancellor really struggle with in collecting this type of information. And then down below that, you'll also see credentials produced through jointly managed programs. So I think as evidenced in the, the, the state of the system address and thinking about the importance of that um, and, and seeing what these jointly managed programs look like and setting baseline and then goals for those um, would also fall within the completion um, the completion kind of column there. Building upon that, underneath the enrollment in the first column, we added another one called enrollment in non-degree and non-credit credentials. So capturing both the enrollment and the actual completion of those students. And I'll, I'll pause for a moment just for your, for your thoughts or concerns. Um, I mean, I appreciate the expertise of uh, the presidents and, and you all. Uh, these seem to be covering the, the essential areas. I think it's good that at least right now um, it, it isn't longer or more complicated. You know, we can work into uh, sort of more and more differentiated analytics, I'm sure, and add things as we go along. But I think it's important to start relatively simple, you know, cover the basics uh, as we get this going. Uh, to me, uh, it, this is the critical piece of redesign. You know, we keep talking about the three pillars, and the first one is ensuring student success. 
And it, it, we have to move from a talking point to something real. And the only way we're going to do that, you know, is, is to set indicators and start measuring and figure out how, how we, you know, make the outcomes better. That's it. It's as simple as that. So the sooner we can get going with that, um, I know the happier I will be. Uh, but, you know, I, 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 I think that really feeds into the seriousness of the redesign narrative. Um, so, you know, uh, again, uh, I would say if we get to a point where it's a question of capacity to be doing all of these things, um, we think about setting priorities in term, and, and this to me is a major uh, priority to get this launched. Great, thank you. Is it worth making a distinction? I don't know if this is maybe some a place where the presidents can weigh in. When you look at completion rates, if you're looking at, I'm, I'm assuming these are total four-year graduation rates of all students, or is it worth making a distinction between first-time, full-time, and total graduation of students? I don't know. I think for comparison purposes nationally, that might be important, but I don't want to get too much in the weeds. I think everybody cares about total, but I wonder what that looks like in the first-time, full-time elements as well. That, that number 11, and I apologize for the font size, so that's specifically looking at that first-time, full-time population. Yes, yeah, so giving that full six years um, for graduation. And, and with each of these indicators, so it's not just that six-year graduation, but it's also by subpopulation. So thinking about basic demographic, um, socioeconomic, those different types of statuses, and looking at those graduation rates um, and then giving our campuses the opportunity to identify strategies um, that, that they have to really address any gaps within those. And, and just to remind folks, um, you know, we began on this goal setting process a while ago. And uh, those goals, we will see first sight of them. Friday. Friday. From the universities. Oh, okay. So we asked universities to set goals using disaggregated and data and a common set of measures. And so we'll be, you know, from, I mean, this is hence the conversation about the accountability framework, because now we're in a position to pull those together and create a dashboard and then have a conversation about is this enough? And should we be pushing harder? Should we be relaxing, dialing back? Um, so, so we're sort of beginning to have a conversation with the board about, okay, well, what does that dashboard look like? What do we do with it? So, so this is, while it is framing a conversation that we'll have in April or July, mm -hmm. remember, mm -hmm. um, it is it is something which we will begin populating <coughs> Friday. Yes, that is correct. And and, and and many of our campuses have, have already submitted theirs as well um, and, and continue to ask really great questions about the process. And as we continue to refine that process, um, I, I really appreciate the partnership that we've had um, within that. So thank you all. So I'll kind of go to, to the next slide, which is talking about university success indicators. So we talked about the student success indicators. Um, these that um, the majority of which have some sort of um, fiscal impact. So university financial strengths, those are your uh, the primary reserve ratio, net operating revenues ratio, and viability ratios. Um, then we have our alternative revenue streams, student support ratios, and financial efficiency. Um, as we began to, again, kind of look at system redesign and that implementation plan, and then thinking about really what was missing, we noticed that there was no um, kind of high-level grouping about employee engagement. So thinking about an, an additional indicator there around just that, that overall employee engagement score. Tomorrow, we're going to talk a little bit more about the survey and the results. Um, but this would give a place for us to really begin to look at that. Um, as the chancellor alluded to, those dashboards and thinking about how we will really show the progress um, and challenges that, we, that we're having within these indicators, this would allow us also to have another category specifically about employee engagement so we could see that progress. Please. I have uh, just a comment. As, as chair of the Universal Success Committee, I would, I would argue that Everything you almost, I think everything you showed for enrollment and for retention on the previous chart for the other committee really holds towards university success because it boils down to basically having students enrolled and and sticking with us. So to me, that's that's a, one of the biggest measures of financial success for universities. 
And uh, we didn't do this artfully well. Apologies to the presidents, but also thank you for your patience. Um, but the objective has always been, and we will deliver on it next year, is that those, these goals and those budgets will align. Not only will they align, they will be developed and reviewed, as, assessed at the university level as part of a singular process so that that synergy is not, is, 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 so, so that we're setting goals while we're thinking about budgets and looking at budgets when we're thinking about student success goals. That's a great point. I just want to, um, on the employee engagement side, uh, I, I, I don't know exactly what you're doing uh, to engage employers, mm -hmm. but are we looking at also the future, what's expected to come in in areas, as areas are transitioning, uh, certainly in the center of the state where there's the coal and the, and mm -hmm. the fracking industry, what that's going to look like in the next five to ten years. So would help us be a predictor of the employees and what those students are going to need to be sure. successful in those areas. So I think that I think that, that is, um, if we go, if I go back a slide under, um, right now it's just called earnings threshold. I would assume that that will evolve um, also with the work of the workforce um, group under student success and thinking about what specific metrics would we put then under there in just addition to an earnings threshold, but really about meeting the needs of the Commonwealth. And so that so, would be different in different areas. That would be areas. different, yes, by, by area as well. And so with this, this employee engagement is, is speaking specifically about our employees of the system and at our universities. Does that answer your question a little bit? Great question. Hey, there, there is research that shows, and I don't know where you would work this, in that in some cases as universities more, move more towards employing more contingent faculty or folks who are at the adjunct level have impact on student success as well. I'm not sure if it's worth mm. highlighting the share of uh, uh, of those that faculty make up as well as an indicator for whether or not an institution is in that area. That's very helpful. Okay. So I'll keep moving forward. So those are the these are you know these were the metrics that were previously affirmed. These are the metrics that universities have been responding to with their strategies, with their goals for the upcoming. It's a five-year um, process, um, and so oops, so going into uh, really this idea that system redesign um, is at a different level which, you know, is exactly what we were talking about before. So thinking about what types of, really what indicators need to be in place so we know at every single layer of that layer cake that we're making the progress that we really intend, um, that we really intend to make. So I'm going to start in kind of that, the yellow. So that's the very top of that, of that layer cake and thinking about um, really engaging these partners. Um, so if you go back, kind of thinking about what those, what that overall objective was, so we, we align that to really what does that look like? So within engaged partners, it looks like increased investment in the system, stakeholder engagement, um, system level employer and other partnerships, grant funding, and some regulatory relief. So we think that if we if we hit those, we know that we'll be moving in the right path along this engaged partners piece of that system redesign implementation plan. As I keep moving, um, I'm going to go um, counterclockwise. Yep, that's right. I had to think about that. Counterclockwise um, for culture and talent. So we talked. We were talking a little bit about employee engagement and what that looks like, and really being able to see the impacts of this. We'll talk tomorrow about kind of some of the strategies and the supports that we have around employee engagement. Um, so not just the survey itself that that was given, but also really what supports are in place and what types of training, and then really thinking about that the measure for that is this improved overall employee engagement, but also that of the ready, willing, and able survey. So as we see movement along those pathways to us, that'll signal that culture and talent, um, that, the, that the work that's going on through the implementation plan is headed in the right direction. As we think about innovation to scale, and I'm just kind of going to quickly go through these, <coughs> thinking about the number, scale, and impact of these innovations that are really all within, um, within that system redesign framework. Shared infrastructure, as, as was mentioned today um, in the state of system address, thinking about that cost savings 
Um, identifying, so just really initially counting um, those shared services that are available through our universities or with, with our universities, but then also assessing the quality of those shared services. And then the participation in cross-campus instruction and programs. So thinking about really what that shared system looks like and really what the infrastructure is in place and then how we can measure that. And then the last one, um, so, so if you think back to those kind of issues for consideration that we had at the beginning, is thinking about how we really um, quantify this, how we know that we're moving forward. So evidence of data-informed leadership decisions and actions, um, and effective, meaningful stakeholder consultation. So thinking about the relationship between what's going on through this process and making sure that all voices are heard at the table and really identifying what those voices, who those voices come from. Um, okay, so particularly on uh, governance and accountability, uh, I, we, we, we have to, and I think you're do, we're doing a good job of this, we have to d distinguish between outputs and outcomes. Mm -hmm. So in terms of governance and accountability, uh, you know, we possibly could add more outputs such as um, uh, the Board of governors receives sort of, I don't know, regular training on accepted best practices in, in board governance, you know, particularly uh, expertise from experts on state system, you know, mm -hmm. board governance, um, mm -hmm. that the board of governors undergoes, uh, which I don't believe we've done, you know, an annual self-assessment of ourselves as, as governors and the effectiveness of, of the board as a whole. You know, we could, we could implement that sort of right away. I think it's an output, not an outcome, but still it starts to get us uh, down the road. Probably the ultimate measure of outcome uh, with governance and accountability is if we're getting done all the things that Dan just talked about. You know, if we can come to the state of the system uh, address and he can tick off all these things and say we've accomplished them, um, you know, to me that's more quantitative, that's evidence of an outcome. Um, so I, I would just urge us to think along those lines. I think it's, um, we're long overdue uh, to be looking at um, uh, those things here, best, best practices. <coughs> I'm sure we all understand what that is and we're getting regular training. I'm on some higher education boards, at least one, where it's like every single retreat is on, you know, best practices. Of, I guess they don't feel we're a good board. I mean, just like over and over and over again. <laughs> Maybe we're not. Um, but, but we don't really do that at all. And so I think we're just, you know, to totally right. And again, this gets back to my comments earlier. I don't care how we're, if it's a, quote, elected board, uh, uh, merit selected, or, uh, you know, politically appointed, which should imply merit because there is, you know, there, there is merit on this board. It's not one or the other. But nevertheless, we understand through our enabling legislation, um, you know, how we are put together as a board, but that is no reason that we cannot be um, uh, uh, trained in understanding and measured on our own uh, best practices um, uh, way of doing business. Thank you. All right. So thinking about next steps, and then we'll go back again and think about those those initi those issues that that we were talking about earlier. So some of this was alluded to earlier as well, and this thought that that really bringing together the goal setting and the budget timelines and processes. And so I emphasize both of those. So, so timelines, meaning things are due at the same time, and then those processes leading up to that, that the information is given, it's submitted together, um, and really allowing that collaboration that happens within campuses to be reflected in, in our processes here. Um, of course, engaging stakeholders and consultation on system redesign effectiveness measures. So that's part of what we're doing today and what we continue to do as we think about how we really hold ourselves accountable through the system redesign lens. Um, and then our set, you know, really to develop draft indicators for the Office of the Chancellor and shared services for stakeholder review and discussion in July. If you think back to that 
the swirly slide with all the words. So there were some of those that were grayed out and one of those sets were Office of the Chancellor and Shared Services. So thinking, you know, that we really kind of need to do some draft work here on really how do we hold those specific groups accountable um, within that within that framework. <laughs> And then the part that, that of course, um, that I would be excited about, really developing some dashboards and thinking about how we can show progress within these indicators at the system level, at the university level, to really help open up that conversation and to give us a launching point to talk about <coughs> our successes and our challenges um, within, within student success and university success. So the timeline for that right now is to have some sort of um, mock-up dashboard for you in April. And then the hope would be based on the timing of when um, the budget work and goal work will be done um, end of August-ish that we would be able to report to the board in October um, really about the progress against those, those goals that, that are being set. So every October we will actually be able to show an accountability dashboard using this framework that we're outlining today that shows the progress in each of those areas, including system redesign. Can I point out for the benefit of the chair? Which chair? Uh, both. <laughs> April 2020. April. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That's, that's next meeting. Aren't you excited? Okay. Move, move, move. Good. It's, it's like a coming attraction. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a tea. <laughs> We're moving. Caramel popcorn is all it would take to like put Thank that you. over the top. It's never and, fast enough for me. And, and then you have to appreciate that we're not even going to wait till the next year to like fully launch into our cycle. Nope. We're just going to go for it right in October. So, so hopefully, um, you know, getting, getting your feedback at that April meeting will let us just really accelerate that so that in our discussion in October, we will actually have two years of the goal setting process under our belts. And just to add, I think, you know, the, the conversation in April is to obviously look at the dashboard and how beautiful it is and admire it and, you know, claim victory. I think the real conversation is what do we do with it? And, and honestly, that's what does the board do with it? I mean, how do we integrate an understanding of our goals, whether student success, university success, and our effectiveness moving system redesign? How do we, what do we do with those numbers when we're making the critical decisions that the board needs to make? which all have to do with money, you know, ultimately, so. Great, so then going back to our questions to consider, um, you know, these, these critical assumptions that we're setting forth with that swirly slide, I think is that just, that's officially what we're going to call it. So the swirly slide um, and thinking about really the partnership that occurs in between um, all, all those groups at the system level, the university level, and then at the individual level, as an assumption, and then taking that and not only using that for our accountability framework, but also really as we think about some of these other um, implementations that we have. And then the measures themselves, I think that, that um, I appreciate your feedback during that discussion and thinking about that. So based on, based on the feedback, um, I think that we're, we're okay to add those measures and think about um, different ways that we can capture and make sure that we are also capturing all the subpopulations that we need to um, and then pulling those pieces together. Any other questions or? All right, great. Well, with that, I'm going to pass it back to Sarah, I believe. Is that right? Or do we? We're back to the chair. Back to the chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sarah. <laughs> thank you. I, 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 you know, I got to follow my script and well, I say, here's thank here's you, Governor Razor. So, so just so you all understand, we have a script. We had a, we had a call to prepare for this. We had a lovely conversation about all of this. And in all of the advanced planning, it was Sarah, it was uh, Rosa to me, to Sarah. <laughs> Katie got thrown in the middle and then threw it back to me, so now I get to throw it back to Sarah. So, way by way. With that as background, ladies and gentlemen, Sarah Bond. Thank you. <laughs> I can follow my script. Thank you, Governor Mason. And, and, and for I the actually, record, Dan was not anywhere in any of our scripts. So that's true. Thank you for that ad lib, Mr. Chancellor. And, and, and really, uh, Governor Mazur, thank you for the uh, conversations in helping set up this um, presentation. 
Um, so I want to give you a bit of a roadmap. This presentation is divided into four different sections, all of them an hour long. <laughs> They're really not. <laughs> They're like 10 minutes. Um, so I'm going to set the baseline really with looking at a quick recap backwards to go forward and look at a framework. And then I'm going to pass it over to Kate, who's, who is going to present a um, student journey with data visualization and look at the inflection points for our students. Um, and then we have a really special treat where we have five university experts who sit on the system uh, redesign teams who are going to be making that data pop with some student personas that will make it real. What is our students going through and how do our uh, student success efforts actually shore up those students? Um, and then we, I assume we're going to take a break at that point as we go into um, the rooms that you want to go to to see a deep dive on any one of the, the five system redesign uh, solution sets um, where you'll get national data, um, the Pennsylvania State system data, and then open it up to, to some questions. Can you do the clicker? Yeah, cool. Um, so I want to get us started with um, these top four questions, and I want to use these as really a filter as we have this presentation for you to start thinking about. And what do you think are the state system strengths relative to student success? Where are opportunities? As you're listening to this presentation, you may have an aha moment where you're pretty surprised about something or um, are interested in it. Jot those down. And then... Um, the big thing is, what do you think is missing? Where are the gaps? What is it that is our blind spot that you're seeing that you think we should possibly address? Um, when we do go into the breakout groups, you'll have an opportunity to talk about these questions again um, in a deep dive. You can go to the next one. So for those of you who are new to the board or were not here in 2018, such as me, I thought what we would quickly do is take a minute and just do a recap and look backwards and um, see where we were to, to where we became uh, today. And so um, back in April, this is the student success definition and the mission that was decided upon. There was a cohort of uh, university experts, um, uh, Penn, uh, Office of the Chancellor experts and others who were part of a task group that looked at what is student success. And what's really fascinating for me is coming in and having been here a year is that this highlights that student success is not just an initiative, but is actually our core values and our core, um, what is at the core of what we do. So both at the system level and at the university level, it's our core business. For, um, also, as we go through this presentation, what you're going to see is that these core tenets pop as we go along. You're going to start to see that this, there's a, a fluidity and a theme that goes through this. And so I want to read it to you. Um, our 14 state system universities provide access to high-value relevant educational experiences that prepare our students in a timely manner for pathways to successful lives and careers. Very good foundational set. So when we think about, you can, sorry, you can go to the next one. There we go. So that definition sets the groundwork and is the cornerstone to what now has become a framework, a student success framework. And there's a lot packed in this slide, so I want to walk you through it. And I want to start with the blue box on the left-hand side uh, with the two words, guided pathways. And many of you may be familiar with Guided Pathways. Uh, for those of you who are not, it's actually a national student success model. It's a very structured education um, where from the access point through the experience while you're going to college or getting a credential to the exit point. And so with that Guided Pathway, um, four principles, or you could think of them as tenets or values kind of rise to the top. And these tenets connect directly with our priorities. And so I want to walk you through them. Everyone has potential to be a lifelong learner. Um, in, in many of our other board meetings, and Dan at the State of the System Address highlighted this, is that upskilling and reskilling the workforce is going to be critically important as technology becomes more prevalent. And so what are the markets that we could address, recognizing that everybody can be a lifelong learner? Learning happens along life's journey. We know this, that learning happens inside the classroom and outside the classroom. And so how is it that we can adequately assess 
the competencies and skills that are learned outside the classroom. Um, I'll give you a good example just of my own personal experience. When I was getting my undergraduate, I had three kids. I was getting a degree in literature. I had to take a childhood literature class. I walked in, there was 25 people in the room, and we had to go around and quickly say something about ourselves. And I said, you know, I have three kids. And Michael Glazer, who is the professor, goes to his drawer, picks out his um, final, says, go into another room and take it. I'm going to see how you do. And I aced it. And he said, you don't need to be here. I'll give you the credits. And so that's competency-based education. That's saying you have, you brought in knowledge that is, can save you seat time and shorten your time to degree based on, on outside the classroom experiences. Um, how and when people learn differs. We hear this all the time. And so this is really getting into a lot of the things that was, again, talked at the um, uh, Dan's speech is in terms of short burst of learning. Um, is it online? Is it blended learning? Is it in the classroom? Do you need a mentor? Those things are really going to be important as we think about the education um, of where we're going. And then last really is, is kind of my, um, my heart is social and economic mobility should be accessible to all. And this really, really pinpoints our student affordability. It pinpoints the um, that we need to close the attainment gaps for many, and we need to pay attention to that. So that, from there, I want to go over to the, what looks like a pretty simple framework. And you say, OK, this is a really cute circle. But there's a lot packed in here. First of all, start in the center. We want everything we do to have every, everything we, t we talk about, everything we do to be with the student in the center. And so access, and the reason it is in a circle is because this can happen at any time. You can access, I call it hop on, hop off. You can come in and come out to an educational experience along the way. And our job is really to retain complete, have them complete, and then get into the workforce. And I want to emphasize again uh, what Kate was talking about is completion really has that umbrella with a vertical of graduation underneath it. So that, that um, degree is equally as important as these other credentials and high impact practices that we can offer to our students. And from there, I am going to turn it over to Kate, um, and she is going to give a data presentation. So I'm going, I'm going to try this from an interactive uh, standpoint, so we'll see how that goes. But if not, you, you do um, have snapshots of these reports um, within the presentation. So I'll be referring to both. Um, so first of all, I want to take us back to this, the circle on the right side. And, and thinking about that. So at the state system, we've done a great job of giving you um, standard um, table reports about access, about retention, about completions, and about workforce. What we're gonna talk about today is a little bit different. So we're coming at it from really a longitudinal perspective. So um, Chair Mazur, back to your, your point earlier about you know, spending a lot of time and thinking about you guys have already made it through the project management, the accountability, and now we're going into longitudinal data. So I know you're very excited. So as we think about how this type of information is different, if you think about your own life cycle and, and moving through um, education, workforce, back into education, et cetera, a longitudinal data approach allows us to look at that. So the reports that I'm going to show you today are really tools that the student success um, group will have, as well as leadership at universities and the board, and thinking about really how we can use data and how we can how we can look at the life cycle of a student and, and then kind of begin to think about what these policies, what these processes are, and what that really means. So first I'm going to show you um, a, a graphic, again, made from an interactive dashboard. So I'm going, to, I'm going to attempt to go to the... I'm kind of far away from the screen, so I may have to have someone... <coughs> Can kind of see it. Okay, great. So this is this is the live dashboard. So what this allows us to do is to think about that life cycle um, and how students are moving through this process within our universities. So you'll see the the bold letters at the top, application. So that's the first column. If you think about it in columns, and then admission, deposit, year one enrollment, and then year two enrollment. So. Anyone that's, that's within that navy blue, those are individuals that are actively um, still engaged with our universities. They're enrolled. Um, as they move up into the gold line of graduated, um, they leave that enrolled line um, for the time being um, and then move up to that line. So at any moment, we can go through and we can see 
what that, what that impact is. So we are also able to look at this by universities, by application year, program level, their program major, race, ethnicity, sex, and state, in particular in-state and out-of-state. So you can begin to see how this progression would look by these various characteristics. So by being able to go through and just kind of dynamically um, choose those pieces. So right now we're looking at a cohort of, I think, five different years of, of students that applied that were then admitted. So that's moving over to this bar. So if you can see my hover, you'll notice that um, there's some words that go along with that too. And looking at 79.2% of our students and then moving into deposited. Now the questions that we have as we begin to think about the meaningfulness of this data is often not in the navy blue path as it goes through, but really in these paths that, that begin to fall off. So here, these are students that deposited but did not end up enrolling. And what you'll, you will also notice is that there's no real line that sends them back up into the, into the navy blue area. Um, now, again, we're looking at the whole system and five years' worth of data. So as we look at this at individual campuses, program areas, demographics, you will notice some of those students going back up into that area, whether it's from the did not deposit um, or or those that did not end up enrolled. So being able to visualize data, I think, is very important, and really taking it from that snapshot of information into more of a storyboard. But we also decided to try out some more advanced analytics on this type of data in particular. So as we began to look, we noticed that once a student is enrolled, the, the area that they are most likely to, um, to stop out at is in between their first and second year. So doing some predictive modeling, and, and it was really, it was a multi-level model. So we, were, so we looked at effects at the system level. Um, we looked at effects at the university level as well. And when, when I say effects, I mean different variables. Um, and then also those at the individual level. So thinking about all of our demographic categories. So when we, when we looked at this and using this to kind of help us visualize what this pipeline looks like, and then statistically, what does this mean? And noting that... Um, Within this model, some of the biggest predictors for second year retention were the total aid received of the students, their GPA, total credits attempted, being an in-state student, and that they were bachelor seeking. So this was just our first kind of uh, swath at looking at this type of information using um, a tool like this to be able to visualize this pathway, but then also putting a statistical modeling approach on top of it as well, so we can actually come out with some of these indicators. So how this works then from the data side, then this type of information is then given over to the student success teams. Um, and then as they continue to ask questions, and then we continue to revise that process. So this is the first um, time that we've really looked at data in this kind of comprehensive picture. Can you show us just a subcategory just to show off the... <laughs> what would you like to see, Chancellor? I, I don't know, pick your fave. Anybody, any board member want to see a You want to see it? Would anyone like to see a major? See a major. Go on. Okay. What would you like? Go to a STEM, STEM. What do you want? Communication. Can you pick something specific? Uh, yeah. You need uh, communications. That's STEM, right? <laughs> uh, how, how, Am I typing? So, so can Kate, someone see? I Kate, can't read what that Kate, says. In, instead of just blindly diving down the rabbit hole, I assume you've seen this data, correct? Yes. Oh, yes. What jumped out at you that you would like to show us? <laughs> well, I, I think that there's a lot to be learned as we look at individual. I'll show math and statistics, by the way. Thank you. That's always a fun one. Um, <laughs> so not anything personal to me at all. Um, but I think that the real value is actually not at the system level, but it's getting down into the university level and looking at those subcategories. So I think that that's something that gives Onward this and tool, downward. That's right. So giving this tool to our universities to be able to use. So, um, so if any IR directors are listening, so, I'm, so we are empowering them to have this information and to also be able to look at that by individual institutions. Um, so I think, that, I think that that's exciting. But this will show you that we can look at math and statistics. We can then even go down into female, which I think is the top one. Um, and then you can see how this pathway, so this is our real data, right? This is our real data about students that applied, were then admitted, um, and then continue to be retained within our system. 
So I think the next one's even more exciting, Chair Mazur. So now I want you to take a look at that year one column. Everyone see it right here? And that's gonna be our starting point for our next, um, for our next visualization. Okay, it gets really exciting. Um, so this one again, you will be able to go in but I think it's exciting. Well, I, I, if chair will permit, I want to call out the, the media moment for this entire board meeting is the first time ever that a Sankey diagram has been interactively presented. We've done due diligence and we've discovered that in 35 years, the board has never seen an interactive Sankey diagram. And I still can't read it. With predictive <laughs> capabilities. There's probably a reason. Yes. If we could actually, if, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. if we could have rotated these these pictures just a little bit, the the uh, monitors that would help me. But that's okay. I'll just I'll just lean further and further in. So now I want now I want us to think again back to that enrolled population. So these are the students that enrolled. And then now we're looking at their life cycle. What you are seeing here is one year worth of data. This is our, these are students that we saw at our institutions for the first time in 2012. So there were over 26,000 of them, students that we, you know, new students that we saw. And so some of those between their first and second year graduate. So these are typically transfer students that are bringing in um, some sort of credit and information that are immediately moving into graduation. And they're about 4% of that enrolled population. So at any moment, again, this Navy, these Navy columns, and we're gonna go through the years. So year one, year two, all the way to year six to see really where are they now. So if they are in that Navy category, they are still enrolled within our institutions. When they move into the gold category, they graduated. And it wasn't just enough to look at our data, but we also look at data from other institutions. This is yes. only undergrad, correct? This is only, this is undergrad. Okay. Yes. Yes, that's a great clarification. Is it Undergraduate. Time, 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 or just? All students that just showed up. Okay, because that's a big difference. It's a big difference, exactly. Time and, five time. and I think that that's an important way to be able to distinguish it when you have those drop downs and you can actually select it for you then to go through and say, so just give me full time. Just give me part time because I think that you will see different. You're really using this as a, as a tool to be able to see those various levels. Great, great point. And, so, and just another yes. the elsewhere is enrolled elsewhere outside of the PASHI system. It's not Correct. moved within the PASHI system. Correct. Okay. So I think that, you know, when you think about this information at a university, you would see the line that they had transferred within the system or outside of the system. For our system level, when we're looking at system level information, we're really just interested that they are still in the PASHI system. So we wouldn't um, distinguish those two pieces in this. No, that makes sense. I just want right. to be sure. Yep. Great point of clarification. So as you look below, we have students, and I'm going between year one and year two into the light blue. Um, you'll see that about 12% of our students after their first year enroll outside of our system. So they're, they're probably transferring, but we know, we know that those students are no longer enrolled at our institutions and they've enrolled elsewhere. And then you'll see as the, this gold, uh, kind of a yellow color, those students have then graduate from those, from those other institutions. And again, back to that base population in year one, we're talking about students that showed up for the first time at our institution in the fall of 2012. The other piece that's really interesting about, about looking at it like this, when we think about graduation rates, so now I'm going, now I'm going to go back and kind of relate it to those board of firm measures. One of those is that six-year graduation rate. The percentages of this are meaningful. So, we are, so if we had this population here, this is where we start in year one at 100% of our population. And then in year six, when you see 60%, <coughs> I believe, 60%. So any of these groups, so for example, students that stopped out here at the very bottom, can someone read that percent to me? 15%, 15.4%. So if those students, for example, um, had continued to be enrolled and had graduated, that would have added 15.4% to that six year graduation rate. So you can go through at any of these points and see so the Sankey, that's the name of this style of diagram, by the way. Um, Any time you see those, those kind of ribbons come down, that's a meaningful percentage 
when you think about the graduation. <coughs> so being able to take this type of information and actually disaggregate it for your own campus data, um, we hope is useful based on some of the feedback that, we're, that we are getting um, from the campuses and really just a, a way to think about life cycle of a student as opposed to the standard um, Excel reports that we typically give. Hey, could you pull out a subcategory African-American male? I can't in this one right now. You do low income? No, but I can in the previous one. So let me, let me ask you a yes. question, though. Yes. When do we get the recommendations that the analysis of this data will provide? When do we get the recommendations that the analysis of these data will provide? I mean, data is great. I yeah, love right? data. But data is only agree. useful to That's give right. you future paths to walk down. Yep, so, recommendations on how to use it. Right. No, well, I mean, I, I think the pre president, yeah, I mean, what does the analysis of the data say we should be doing differently or the same mm -hmm. to create better outcomes? Because that should feed goals and, you know, the whole thing. Yep, absolutely. So I think that this, adding this to that group of those enterprise management tools and thinking about using this as a part of the goal setting process about using this as we think about our enrollment and what that looks like as the population changes within the state of Pennsylvania, then that high school population, how that may or may not impact, may impact um, what you're seeing here. And by really being able to fold all of those pieces together, I think that that, that, that absolutely is the next step. So hopefully providing this, this will become one of those enterprise management tools that, that allow our student success teams and the work going on at the universities to move forward. And I think it's important, again, going back to that swirly slide, this is a shared accountability. So obviously our universities already use this kind of information in order to establish their goals. Now those goals will become apparent and then we will be able to have conversations again using this tool saying, oh, okay, we're looking at University X for a Y percent bump in the uh, first to second year retention. I'm making this up. Here's what the data show. These are the students, the percent of students that we're losing is a Y percent bump. Realistic? Is it too much? Is it too little? What are the assumptions underlying that? So the conversation is what's going to be really important. Obviously, I'm very excited about the data, but using them is more important. And, and where it pulls together is, is it's not just, it, it's, it's uh, in, a, in addition to that, uh, is the system um, in a position to provide supports to help make that, you know, mm -hmm. bump happen? If not, what, what do we have to do? in order to provide that support. So it, it all has to come back to that, including uh, our system accountability too. Great, yes, please. A couple of comments. Uh, one related to what David was talking about is this is great, it's showing us what. What we need to know in order to get, develop an action plan is why. Mm -hmm. Why did they leave and graduate elsewhere? Why did they drop out? What are the reasons? And I think you know, that's, where we've got to get to. The other observation I make is, is I have interest in what's to the left of the first shot slide you showed, which is go back to how many are graduating from the from high schools and how does that lead to what percent we're getting? Because what, we, what we're looking at right now is the funnel as it is. Ultimately, we have to enlarge that funnel somehow or other, I think. Can I ask a question about just about the, all the slides that you guys put together? So you can see at the end, it stops at six years, and that's where we're tracking our students. But we haven't talked anything about tracking past that. You know. And it seems to me like if we're looking for accountability, this would be a baseline year where you're going to figure out exactly from a student's perspective how much money you're making, how much do you have in student loans, what's the percentage relevant to that, how has your degree actually got you a job, and did it get a job within the... Uh, the plan that you had, or did it make a difference in you getting hired? We need some subjective measures that could be have some quantifiable parts to it to let us know that this is our baseline year. Five years out, our students are actually more affordable. They're paying less in terms of student loans. They've got better jobs, or at least they're getting jobs. Is there any plan to include some survey mechanisms of our alumni to make sure that they're being successful? So I'll, I'll show you kind of what we're brainstorming here and what our initial stab at that looks like. If, if I could just go ahead and go into this slide. Um, this one looks a little different. Okay. So this is showing us, before we talked about access to retention, that was the first. 
And then we talked about retention to completion. And now we're really looking at completion to the workforce. So these are um, actual workforce outcomes um, for our students. This is not a survey. This is based on their actual um, employment data within the state of Pennsylvania. So I'd like to start out with a couple of caveats. Um, one being that this is only for students working here in state. Um, you'll notice that before we had this kind of flow of students, these data are longitudinal in nature, but it's a data break. So we basically, um, at this time, uh, are looking at them once they complete and then moving forward. So we're not able to go back, um, but we will be able to do that very soon. So we're, we're really excited about that. But this is our first time really looking at this type of information. Well, across the bottom, is that I'm sorry. Salary oh, yes. So, so let me walk you through what this looks like. So you'll see these little um, people icons. Um, those represent the percentage working um, here within the Commonwealth. And then the different bars are at three years, five years, and 10 years out. The height of the bar represents the average salary. We've grouped these into very, very broad academic categories, basically to try to get them all on one page. So these are in icons at the top, and then we actually describe what they are at the bottom. So the first, the light blue, is arts and humanities, business and communication, education, health, social and behavior sciences, and human services, STEM, and then other, kind of our miscellaneous category. So what you can do is you can actually go through and see um, how these, how what th this is really our first time looking at this type of wage data, so we can see how this progresses from three year, five year to 10 years. Um, that dashed line that you see, that is on average how much high school graduates make. So that's just to give you a little bit of, of kind of understanding what these, um, what the height of the bars mean. Overall, on average, 70% of our students that complete work here in Pennsylvania. Um, that's high, that, that's, a, that's a great number, and that doesn't even take out our out-of-state students. So that's all of our students. 70% are working here contributing to the Commonwealth. And I think that that's a really important metric to think about. Um, and then you can also see kind of the height of some of these bars and that differential between that first year that they're out and the 10th year. So what we did to kind of consolidate this data, this is a lot of cohorts of data, as many as we could really grab um, for each of these groups. So it's not just one cohort, one year of information. Um, you know, and thinking about three years out, I think there are 10 different years um, of graduates grouped into that, just to give you a little bit of perspective. This is also available by university, and it's available by degree level. So what you're looking at right now are all of our degrees. We could then just show that for bachelor degree. And then we could also show it for our certificates that we are currently able to capture, our associate degrees, and graduate degrees as well. So hopefully this addresses at least a part of your question and thinking about um, what, what's past that, what's past that six-year graduation, um, and then where that goes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, um, can, the, I assume by average you're using a mean here. You could also do median and distribution we, statistics. On that, that is right. So right. in our first, the way, the way this data came back in aggregate form, we're working on a, an agreement so we can actually provide medians, and then really that kind of um, level of comfort, basically, that we have with those numbers. Thanks. I, I, I would find it useful, personally, if we also had a measure, not just of high school grads, of what the typical um, college salary is in that area, because, you know, we, I'll use social work as an example. We all know that social workers, in general, don't make as much as other professions, but I'd be curious to know if Slippery Rock social workers we're at least making what a typical social work makes. I, I actually think that a great place for that would be, so this is dynamic, so as you hover over, to me it seems like you could put in the context around that particular bar within that hover over, so you could really, so you could really get that grasp, because I, I would assume that that would also vary by region. 
Yeah, yeah, I, something like that. So, somewhere where we can get that kind of indicator. You could also do, do it by, uh, by, by sort of a gradient of color within the bar. You know, mm -hmm. a, a slightly okay. darker blue gets you to the average, and, and then and yours continues. I mean, something like that where we can, we can see that. Okay. Thank you. Other, other thoughts as we wrap up the, the longitudinal data portion of the afternoon? I actually have one more thought about the, the previous slide. You don't need to go back for it, but as you're looking at the, those tr trend data, one thing that would be really useful for us is to really understand, and, and I know this has to be done at the local level, um, but understand the reasons for stopping out and, and dropping out, because that actually is what implies the mm -hmm. interventions. Mm -hmm. and, and these data are great to where they are. And I know we do exit interviews. We try to track <coughs> the students down. Sometimes the exit interview data, data is good. Sometimes you get the sense that the person just wanted to get out of the room really quickly. Yeah. Uh, so um, so I, I don't know what it is, but as you're thinking about it, to maybe think of tools that can help us figure that out um, would, would be useful. I think that that's actually a really great segue into the student success work and thinking about really at any of these kind of as the ribbons begin to pull off, what's the story that goes with that? I think that that's such a critical piece. So b before I turn it over to Sarah, any other thoughts? Can I just make one summary observation? Um, I do want to just underscore that why these data are important. Um, so when we were preparing this presentation, it was important for me to have the first ever Sankey presentation to the board. But <laughs> Sarah and Kate prevailed and um, had other reasons. And so the first thing is they obviously support the analyses that we all do. And I, I don't want to mislead anyone. Universities on the whole do these kinds of analyses all the time in order to, but they do it differently. Now, that's not a bad thing. It's only a bad thing if we're trying to make, you know, as a board, allocation decisions and judgments that are based on, you know, um, uh, uh, analyses, they need to be done commonly. Uh, and so it creates a common a lingua franca in order for us to have a conversation to know, to have you know uh, uh, conversations that enable us to understand the challenges and the successes that our universities are seeking to address and pursue. So the support of the, the predictive capability is super important. It's already something that our universities do. The ability to do that predictive work in a common way is really powerful in a system wide <coughs> Uh, approach. So that's really important. The second is if you go to the, um, well, any of these slides, it supports advocacy, right? So if you look at the, you know, you look at the graduation rates, so and we could sum to, well, you know, we could say our 60% graduation rate, you know, it's average for schools in our sector largely. Um, <laughs> but if you look at the number of people who start here and eventually graduate, it's about, it's the combination of those uh, blue lines. It's pretty high. You know, it's about, you know, so we're, we're an accelerator of facts, a different kind of advocacy than we, or if you go to the, um, to the, to the workforce, to the salary data, um, our students routinely earn by five years out, they are um, not just at, but above the high school graduation rate. And clearly this, uh, 10 years out, they're easily returned their investment. By 40 years out, they've more than returned their investment in high school, in college. College is worth it, right? It's worth it. It doesn't matter what you go into, college is worth it, and it's important to continue to drive that point home. Um, the staying power of our students in the state of Pennsylvania. So advocacy is, is really important. And then to the conversation, the, the point I made earlier, um, the point of doing this is to support the conversation that we're going to have to make, which are really ultimately about trade-off decisions, you know, trade-off and um, uh, trade-off decisions and also trying to, you know, get the support that we need in order to drive to good out outcomes. So those three reasons, you know, we, it's, it's, it's great to talk about student success as an, op, as, as an outcome. Um, and it would be really cool to race into lots of really interesting financial aid and affordability or workforce, right? But the real question isn't what should we do? The question is where's the bang for the buck? Where's the priority, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, so it seems slow and plodding doing things like financially stabilizing ourselves and building data tools and accountability framework. But how else do you know where to target your, your efforts, right? And so getting to that conversation is required really putting in place some basic infrastructure and then learning how to use that infrastructure in a, in a common way. So anyway, just want to make those points. Well, it, which brings us all back to the accountability and governance uh, outcome that we're making data-driven decisions. We're applying, resources are always going to be scarce. I don't care how much we have, but we're applying them to priority areas 
we're setting outcomes for the application of those dollars and we're seeing it or we aren't and we're tweaking. So it, 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 again, you know, it all works together. I do have a request and I, and I think this could be helpful. There's a lag between, I mean, you, you guys are making tremendous progress in developing these tools and dashboards. There's a lag between board meetings. It doesn't allow for us to really dig deep and think about what does this mean for things that we put out in terms of recommendations. I know the presidents think about this all the time with their IR folks. I think it would be helpful if there was some scaffolding done, even within the various committees that we had, that teach us how to translate these into initiatives at the system level. So for example, if there are things being done with regards to survey instruments at the IR level at institutions that are beyond their capacity as we think about tracking students beyond graduation, maybe that's a role that we set for the system in an initiative. We can assist with the tracking, like we invest our resources in that way. That way we're, we're enhancing or offsetting what can't be done at the institution that's, level in the right. aggregate. Because I think we all know that everyone's positioned differently in terms of resources. This way our initiatives within the portfolios direct relate, are relate directly to these. We really don't have a whole lot of time as Board of Governors to think about that translation. So the, most, the more that you can help us make that translation, it might expedite some of these uh, uh, areas in the portfolio that didn't have initiatives yet, like student success. Right, that's great. That's really helpful. <coughs> President. Oh yes. Okay. When will uh, when will the institutions have access to these resources? We um, just um, we we are in the process of implementing a data visualization platform system wide, which is what these are built in. So as that goes out, so your IR person already ha actually already has the software to do it. So we need to send those out. We can do that. I think as early as next week, just you know, for use kind of in their draft form until we, um, you know, until we kind of collect some of this feedback and make some adjustments. So as early as next week. Yep. Sarah, are we going to go into breakouts now? Um, no, we were going to have the. Um, our five uh, university experts. Oh, they're going to lead us in. Centers. Yeah. I wanted to quickly, I'd be remiss not to put a little bit of color around the amount of rigor that goes into these five teams. Um, and it's relative to the data conversation. All of these five teams um, looked at the national data and exemplar institutions that have either done this work or are in the process of doing the work. And from there, they could see where the greatest impact was, where we should be focusing our energy. From there, emerging themes, two or three emerging themes are coming out. And from there, we're going to the data analytics team and saying, what data do we have that we currently can say? Where do we really focus? So it's a funnel approach of casting our net wide. In financial aid, I think we had maybe 40 different um, opportunities to look at. And we narrowed it down now to three. Um, and from there, we'll have to see what order we scaffold the work. So I want to recognize that these teams are working closely with data analytics to really see what data we have. From there, um, I want to pass it over to my colleagues over here. Um, and I thought maybe we could go in order. They're going to just give um, two-minute um, student personas that is going to really make the, the data pop. And so, John, if we want to start with And you. just from a scheduling perspective, after they're done with their two-minute introductions, we're going to take a 10-minute break. And then we're all going to head into our breakout. Breakouts. So Excellent. that's just bear with us for another few minutes, and then we'll <coughs> get you to a break. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Sean Albright. Yes. Is your mic on? I, I may be insufficient. Maybe too tall for that old one. <laughs> Maybe get a chair. On top. All right. Microphone management was not in the curriculum. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is John Ulrich. I'm the provost and VP for Academic Affairs at Mansfield University. I am the lead on the university side for the development education team. Developmental learning support for mathematics can take many forms. Specific developmental level courses designed to address foundational concepts and skills that the students need to progress to the next level. Co-requisite courses, workshops, or labs that are required alongside a college-level math course. Tutoring support and supplemental instruction embedded right into the math course. 
adaptive learning platforms that assess each student's individual needs and create personalized learning modules to address those needs, or any combination of these and many other instructional strategies. When we think of students who need these resources, we often think of recent high school graduates who struggled in mathematics and therefore need additional learning support to meet their educational goals <coughs> at the university level. However, today I'd like to call your attention to another category of students often in need of developmental learning support, particularly in mathematics, the adult learner who is going back to school, so to speak, and who has not had instruction in mathematics for 10, 15, or even 20 years or more. The story of one such student I'd like to share with you today. This individual from a low-income family struggled in high school and dropped out prior to completion. Over the next 15 years, he continued to struggle to find his path in life, spending some of that time in prison. Eventually, he began turning his life around, earned his GED, and was admitted to one of our state system universities with an interest in STEM. The placement process at that institution indicated that this student needed developmental learning support in mathematics, especially so given his interest in pursuing a STEM degree. At this particular university, the developmental mathematics course featured a self-paced format utilizing an adaptive learning platform that tailored the instruction to his specific needs. The course was delivered in a special lab setting that included embedded tutoring support. The self-paced format of the course suited the student's background and allowed him to get caught up after many years out of formal education. He performed well in the developmental course, and the effectiveness of learning support he received was evident in his success in his subsequent mathematics courses, including calculus. As he progressed through the mathematics sequence, this student continued to take advantage of the tutoring support provided by the university. His confidence and interest in mathematics continued to grow, so much so that he was soon double majoring in a science field and mathematics. He is now an honor student, a winner of multiple merit scholarships, and on track to complete his educational goals. Without that intervention at the developmental level, it is quite possible that this student and others like him would not have received the learning support necessary to realize their educational and career objectives. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Brian Hazlett. I'm the Vice President for Student Affairs and Enrollment Management at Millersville University. Across our system, we are experiencing a significant increase of students identifying as first generation. Uh, in fact, the research shows that over 22% of students entering college now across our country are first generation. Unfortunately, only 24% of those students complete their degrees. A significant portion of first generation students are also low social economic status backgrounds. For those students, the college process is complicated and family support is often limited due to their own newness with the process of navigating the major levels of, of a college process that they have to go through. First generation students must balance not only the academic demands of degree completion, but also addressing the financial demands related to affordability and success. In today's economy, higher education is no longer a luxury for the privileged few but a necessity for individual economic opportunity in our global society. It's, in fact, it's the greatest pathway to social mobility. Further, a college education remains the best investment a, college stu a student can take, and the cost can also be prohibitive. Many students, even when correctly budgeting, find themselves struggling with trying to afford college. Such was the case with Mary. Mary is a traditional age student from a single parent household she is the oldest of five children, the first to go to college, and is majoring in education with the goal of becoming a teacher. When Mary was a freshman, she didn't show up for class around the midpoint of the semester, which was very unusual for Mary since she was an excellent student. The faculty member was aware of Mary's background and made it a point to talk with her. She learned that Mary was struggling with paying for college, but also was struggling with some food insecurities, and that she had taken a part-time job to try to fill the gap. Both the food shortages and the job had conflicted with her class schedules. The professor immediately put her in touch with the campus food pantry, which supports students who do not have enough to eat. She also contacted the financial aid office, who found her additional funds and a job on campus to pay uh, in a federal work study position. Today, Mary is a senior and will be graduating in May with a degree in education. She works in the financial aid office and encourages other students to use the sources of the food pantry, utilizing other student support services across the campus as well. The guidance provided to her by her faculty member and the financial aid counselor were critical to her success and her degree completion. Thank you.
Hello, I'm Margaret Ball. I'm chair of the theater department at East Stroudsburg University, and I have led the first year experience committee for the last four years. Holistic advising intentionally coordinates the different support systems crucial to student success. The story I'm going to tell you illustrates how wide a range of departments and services come into play in an actual case. This is Grace's story. I met Grace when she first arrived at university. She struck me as confident, energetic, and a determined student. I vividly remember her coming up to me at the accepted student's open house. She told me she was a science major and she had been encouraged to take science because it would get her a job. But she confessed what she was really interested in was performing. I suggested to her that she sign up for an acting class. So I ended up having Grace in my first year experience class, where I learned she was a first generation student who had lived for several years in foster care and had endured unspeakable abuse. She was an excellent student, always on time with her homework. At the end of the semester, she asked to speak to me. She had done very poorly for Grace in her science classes. Her heart just wasn't in them. Where her passion lied was with performing. So I suggested courses that would truly strengthen her soft skills and that would prepare her for the field of the arts, whether it be administration or performance. She took my advice, but also stayed registered for a biology course, just in case she changed her mind. A few weeks later, I heard from her again. She was having financial issues and did not know how to succeed or proceed. I called one of our financial aid officers and she was most happy to assist Grace and helped her with finding additional aid. Then later in the third week of classes, and this is the second <coughs> semester, Grace was back in my office. Quote, I am going to drop my biology class. I am just not interested. I've tried the tutor, and it just isn't where I want to be. So by this point, she had already auditioned and been cast in the musical and as the lead in the main stage play. So I said, OK, drop it, and we can talk again at the end of the semester. Since that time, Grace has had several leading roles, and she is also one of our top academic students. But during the last production, her birth mother and a foster mother turned up in her life again. This really triggered Grace. She missed classes, and eventually she called me wanting to meet. <clears throat> I asked her what was wrong, and she said, I just don't think I can go on. I can't deal with this. I asked if she had a counselor, and she said, no, I said, would you like to see our counselors? And she said, I don't think they can get me in. It's too late in the semester. So I called the counseling services and they said, yes, that day they had a drop-in session. And if she came down early, they would get her in. She went. The next day I saw her and she was 100% better. She'd done the performance. She'd seen her birth mother and she was coping. I have no doubt that Grace is on the road to success. She has learned to create for herself what we call a go-to team, a network of professors, of staff, of counselors who can support her in learning the competencies to navigate through university and beyond. Thank you. I'm David Wilmus. I'm the Chief Student Affairs Officer at Slippery Rock University. I, got, I pulled the card of going after the theater professor. <laughs> so, 
I'm going to talk to you a little bit about mental health. Um, colleges and universities across the nation have seen increased demand for college counseling services. Counseling centers have long wait lists and high expectations from students and parents. Nationally, demand for counseling services rose over 40% between 2012 and 2017, while nationally enrollment only grew by about 5%. And not only has the number of students accessing these services increased, but the severity of the presenting issues have deepened. Nearly one third of college students report that they have been diagnosed by a professional with one or more mental health issues in the last year. The top issues faced by students include anxiety, depression, and difficulty sleeping. These mental health challenges directly impact students' ability to be successful academically. If a student is facing depression so severe that they can't get out of bed, how are they gonna to go to class, study, and learn? And Pennsylvania is not immune to these trends. Our students are coming to us with greater needs, which push us to explore how we can best support them and help them attain a college degree. The good news is we can help these students if we can identify them early and get them connected to the appropriate services. One illustrative example comes from a student I'll call Candace. Candace is an African-American female from the Pittsburgh area who was raised in a low-income, single-parent home. As a first-year student living on campus, Candace came to the attention of her resident assistant during the first week of school. Her roommate reported that Candace was cutting herself, which some individuals do in order to cope with emotional pain. After some conversations with Candace, we learned that she'd recently completed an inpatient hospitalization for depression and suicidality three weeks before the start of the semester. We quickly connected Candace to our counseling center who did a preliminary assessment. Based on her history and diagnosis, diagnoses, the counseling center faculty concluded that Candace was out of their scope. She would need intensive, regular outpatient therapy in order to address her mental health issues. Our case manager worked with Candace to connect her to an outside provider who bills on a sliding scale and to help arrange for regular transportation to these appointments as she didn't have a car. This connection to local off-campus services, coupled with regular check-ins from our case manager, allowed Candace to be able to stay on top of her mental health while pursuing academics and tra transitioning to college. Today, Candace is a junior. She still struggles with her mental health and receives off-campus therapy regularly, but she's also a solid student has a strong and supportive peer group on campus, and serves as a peer mentor. I know for certain that our early identification of this student and connecting her to the proper resources have helped her, help us retain her to the university. Thanks. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Zeb Davenport, and I'm the Vice President for Student Affairs at Westchester University. And, uh, I'm glad I'm following Dave and not Margaret. Brian and I were over there talking, and we said, God, I'm glad I don't have to follow her. <laughs> no, you're not chopped. Right? <laughs> and I know I stand between you and the snacks. I already checked them out. There's cookies and chips and soda, so let me jump right into it. I'm going to talk a little bit about workforce readiness. According to ch career change statistics, the average person will change careers five to seven times during a working life. Some research also suggests that employees change jobs every four to five years. And we've all witnessed the impact that technology and the automation of jobs have had on the current workforce. Uh, so to remain viable, many of our, many employees are looking to be reskilled, upskilled, with competencies that are transferable across any industry. Our current students are learning skills and competencies both in and out of the classroom that can be generalized across many careers. Institutions, through their academic and co-curricular programming, continuing education departments and career centers are helping students and others navigate career uncertainty and job transitions. Enter John, this is on behalf of you. Enter John. John is a non-traditional student and veteran who experienced firsthand the need to reinvent himself through upskilling his expertise while building on his current competencies. 
Initially hoping to serve in the military his entire career, John would tell you that life didn't turn out the way he had planned. After spending 11 years in the Air Force, through three deployments, John decided that he needed to upskill his talents by going back to college. After consulting with the Career Center to learn about skill development and job opportunities that aligned with his interests, he now has a better understanding of what is needed to enter the workforce. John is attending courses and participating in programs that will prepare him for a career in the highly needed cybersecurity field. He recently completed an internship in information technology to accelerate his hands-on experience, and he plans to deepen that experience through the cybersecurity internship that he found in the, through, through working with the folks in the Career Center this summer. The Career Development Center also supported him with rewriting his resume in a way that highlights the newly acquired skill set that employers are seeking in the current job market. John now regularly refers other veterans to the Career Center for guidance. Many of them would not have reached out for advice to the Career Center had it not been for John. So not only is he benefiting from the services, but he's also now a conduit to bring his peers into that space that sometimes might feel a little intimidating. Although nervous about leaving the military after 11 years, John is on a path to a career that meets the workforce demands through the support services and success initiatives offered on campus. John will graduate in 2021. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, you good? Yeah, we're good. You Thank wanna, you. How, that was, how, um, how are we going to assign breakout rooms? Oh, Randy, you do yeah. the breakout. Go to the next slide. Yeah. Go to the next slide. There you go. There um, you go. We're going to ask you to self-select. You heard the presentations. Hopefully one of those stories connected with you on one of these topics. And so you decide which one you want to go to. Board members, presidents, members of the audience, these are open sessions, so you're, you're welcome to go to any one. The idea of this is you'll come out of this more informed and probably an advocate for that issue you here on the board or within the cadre of presidents. And then so you'll be able to stay engaged in that issue going forward. Um, again, the room, the, the, the issue or the uh, topic that'll be here is um, workforce readiness. So if you choose to stay here, just know that we'll be in this room otherwise. Are we coming D &D back here? Is that small room there? A, B, and C are right where we had lunch, and the rooms are marked. <laughs> and then it's five after three, so everyone should try and head to their rooms around 315, and we will start promptly at 320. Thank you. PCN offers Pennsylvania organizations, business, and associations the opportunity to have their message telecast statewide. Fusion on PCN is a platform for you to reach out to all of Pennsylvania using our statewide cable network and online streaming. You produce the content with your message and PCN delivers it statewide. Fusion is a partnership that helps expand your reach and meet objectives through an alliance with PCN. Go to PCNTV.com slash Fusion for more information. Thank you all for doing the breakouts. Uh, I wandered through, Sarah, welcome back. Um, <laughs> I wandered through all of them and uh, there were some interesting discussions, uh, some interesting uh, things were going on. So now we're gonna have um, everyone report back and uh, I think we might as well just start in the same order that we did with the introduction. So with that as preview. We Thank you. I'm reporting back from the developmental education breakout session, which focused on uh, developmental mathematics. As far as strengths, um, certainly I think the, the dedication and commitment with which our faculty deliver instruction and learning support for developmental math is, is evident. Um, developmental math course completion rates in the system compare very favorably to the national average. Our course completion rates are higher than the national average, for example. Um, where there are opportunities, I think, um, and I think our breakout session um, brought this to the fore, certainly there are oppor opportunities for coordination of effort, for sharing of information, um, for 
uh, making sure best practices around <coughs> developmental mathematics are implemented um, across the system. So there's an opportunity for scale, uh, best practices related to placement, for example, multiple measures, placement processes, um, for providing co-requisite learning supports embedded within or alongside um, college-level math courses, um, curricular design that, that offers math pathways that are consistent with the student's educational and career goals, um, and uh, courseware like adaptive learning platforms that actually can assess where the student is individually, what the student's individual needs are, and then uh, create modules that are, that are tailored to that student's uh, particular developmental needs. <laughs> I don't know if I have anything surprising. I, I can tell you what's unsurprising is that um, in a system that hasn't uh, really talked much across 14 institutions about mm -hmm. developmental math education, it's not so surprising that each university has developed its own particular set of policies and procedures that govern how students are placed in developmental mathematics. And it's quite apparent um, to us and our developmental ed team that it's, it's possible that a student who matriculates at one system university and goes through that placement process might be placed into developmental math at that institution, but had they matriculated at a different uni university and gone through a different placement process, they might not have been. And so that degree of uh, potential inconsistency is something we want to try to address. Um, that's the piece I would say uh, is missing, but uh, since we've been working uh, since this summer on this task, it's now coming more and more, uh, I think, into focus in terms of what uh, we can be doing as a system where developmental math is concerned. And as was alluded to earlier, we have uh, nine of our universities partnered with the RAMP Corporation <laughs> to submit a grant application. Uh, we submitted it in early December. We'll know in June if we have it, but the purpose of that, uh, that grant funding is to conduct a study um, about the best practices for placing students into developmental math, and it will compare different ways of doing so. It, it will contribute to the national conversation. If we get this funding and conduct that study, it will contribute to the national conversation on developmental ed math reform um, and give us a good basis for uh, moving forward. Can I ask an unfair question? I just did. Asking my permission? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, all right. <laughs> I'm a, if you were to having you know gone through that experience and collected the data, um, understanding national practice and you know getting a better understanding of where our universities are now, um, if we were aggressively to take on the kind of recommendations that your team has made, where do you think? What kind of improvement could we expect to see in our six-year graduation rate in six, in five or six years? <laughs> That's a really unfair. I mean, no. But if you had to ballpark it, what do you think DevEd is worth in terms of student improvement? Well, we're seeing we're seeing on average yeah. uh, course completion rates around eighty yeah. percent in developmental math, which, it, as I said, compare, compares favorably to the national. Data. So I would first think about that 20% that aren't completing yeah. developmental math and therefore are not attaining a credential. Yeah. And then what's the relationship between that 20% and the 6 what, in, in the John showed a 15%-ish gap on average between people who start in dev math and 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 uh, the graduation rates of people who start in dev math. Yeah, we, we, in our team we called it credential completion gap. Yeah. So we looked at the... Um, 2013 cohort, yeah. followed them for as many years as we could, five and a half years, yeah. looked at those who were required to take developmental math versus <laughs> those who were not, yeah. and we found that um, for those who were required to take developmental math, 15, about 15% 15 fewer yeah. attained a credential within that time frame. And, and the reason I'm asking... that's the cause, yeah. but it's an association. And just so we know, the reason I'm asking you, just to be clear, is that, and it ties it back to the, pr the predictive analytics, is that, I mean, I'll, it, helping students succeed is the right thing to do. It also helps us address really serious financial challenges. And so we should be throwing ourselves into the areas 
where we can see the biggest bump, you know, and then in terms of priority, and this is now a personal view, not a mandate from a chancellor. In terms of prioritizing, <coughs> it, for me, it makes sense to prioritize things which achieve the biggest bump sooner rather than later. And that's, I, I just think it's something we should all, one of the things I'm experiencing through system redesign is that we are super stretched. And so really focusing down on the things that are going to move the needle to me, I think is, is going to be important for us. And dev math, obviously, they're all, all the areas we're going to talk about, but um, are, are important that way. I would just urge us to think in those terms <coughs> if we can. And then also to think really hard about goals because it is not worth doing stuff to get a half percent or a one percent improvement overall. I mean, we want to throw ourselves at things that do three, five, seven, and eight percent. I mean, just a thought. There anyway. um, I guess my only, there's so much here, but what's the, what's the most immediate benefit to the investment? Most immediate investment is more students um, progressing toward a credential on time. And eliminating a barrier. Right, we're eliminating the barrier. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't sound like it's that difficult <coughs> to implement, in theory. Theory. Um, there are. <laughs> <laughs> there are, you know. <laughs> That to the right. <laughs> there, for example, there are curricular implications, right, for the des design of de developmental ed. So if we're talking, we have to be clear about if we're talking about <coughs> simple standardization of approach, mm -hmm. we're talking about um, a set of approaches, all of which uh, adhere to best practices that have evidence behind them nationally to show that they work. Um, because if you have a set of such practices, they can be implemented and tailored for the particular circumstances of each university. And which would you recommend? I am getting good questions. <laughs> there, there has to be a degree of, in my opinion, a, a degree of coherence in our approach to um, developmental mathematics, both at, in terms of placement processes and uh, curricular design, but I'm stopping short of saying that every university has to have the same curriculum, right? Or, or it's... We don't have to um, have it at every university, we just have to have it available at every university. But that'll apply to a lot of things we talk about. An example I would give is co-requisite learning support. There are many, many different ways to design co-requisite learning support, but they could all achieve the same. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions before we adjourn? <clears throat> I'm going to do what I tell my students not to do, which is to work off my phone from the notes. But <laughs> as I get older, this gets much more difficult. Lois, thank you for taking notes today. Um, we started off with looking at some national and, and also state level data. Um, from that, we determined at least some gaps that we would like to look into a little bit deeper, which one was how has the demographics across the state population changed in relation to the high school population with driving a little bit deeper into income range and also looking down at even at the level of the county so that we can get a little bit more specific as to is there regional things that are happening across the state that could uh, dictate the levels of, of leverage that we would need to put in place behind uh, financial aid. When we looked at system strengths, um, the thing that really came out clearly is that over the past several years, there has been a, a big movement towards student centeredness and the fact that we are really focusing on the student, really treating you know, every student as an individual, especially with the work that's happening within the financial aid offices where you know, th there's a misconception that financial aid offices are just putting together packages. What they're not realizing is that they're spending a tremendous amount of time counseling students as well as counseling families to be able to show them the pathway to be able to make a degree um, obtainable. Uh, we also talked a little bit about, uh, as, as the Chancellor just mentioned, is there opportunities to, to segment different populations and put resources behind certain populations that would result in the greatest levels of success. Uh, we talked a little bit about how some institutions are targeting financial dollars behind bridge programs 
because that's something that they know that students that have that that barrier and how can they break that barrier down. Um, opportunities, we talked a lot about the fact that we need to um, educate and promote the difference between net price and sticker price um, in relation to the fact that a lot of families don't necessarily have a strong understanding between those two uh, and that we really do kind of have a, an award per se in the form of our state appropriation subsidy and how can we put a dollar amount behind that so the families understand that if they're from Pennsylvania, they're receiving this subsidy, that they can look at that in their, their total financial aid package. We also talked about one, uh, one big, big lift would be, is there an opportunity to, to put together um, some, some opportunities to look at, should there be a common financial aid model across the state for both publics and privates? Um, that was something that we did talk slightly about. Um, what's missing? Uh, you know, promoting four-year graduation rates is extremely important, especially because the fifth year can be what would be the most expensive for families. So showing the value of what our institutions can do to get the students in the door, but also through and across the stage. Uh, and then finally, um, you know, we, we talked a little bit about, you know, opportunities related to cost, uh, related to textbooks and how can we reduce the cost of textbooks. Basically looking at what are some of the hidden costs that students aren't ready for. So students will look at a piece of paper and say, okay, this is their tuition, this is our room and board, but what are some of the other costs that are out there that we could put in place? So we talked a lot about open resources and how can that be put in place to kind of lower the cost for students overall. That's about a summary of what we discussed. Any questions? Can I ask an unfair question? Sure. So if you were to sort of swing, you know, what, what would you encourage us to sort of swing for the fence kind of goal, five years, whether measured in terms of student retention and or um, cost saves to students? Based through our efforts, obviously it's hard to predict, you know, Available right. funding from the state in, in relation specifically to financial. So the, so the package of kind of yeah the yeah. package of kind of work you think we ought to be doing in financial aid. Yeah. That's where I think it's it's extremely important to look at where you where you as an institution sit within the state. Yeah. Because that's going to look different based on where where you're housed within the state. Meaning that um, the families from some of our, our some of our counties are coming into higher education with a very different financial picture than what a family can be from the suburbs. But if I were to ask you to join me next month in sitting in front of the appropriations, <laughs> this, is a, this is a great idea, Brian. I'm warming to this. Um, and, you know, we were to take a question about, you know, in five years, where do you think you can be with financial aid and affordability work? I, I think that if we can put, start to put together resources to show that the dollars that we are investing in financial aid are resulting yeah. in higher, higher percentages of students being retained and graduating, yeah. um, then I think we could move the needle. Um, but I think for us, we're just getting into that business as a system of really looking at applying deeper, deeper uh, financial aid packages, looking at how do you use you know, revenues from tuition to be able to put back into students' packages to make it more affordable. Um, as, an institution, as institutions, I think we're just getting into that business heavily. Um, and I think that's something that's going to allow us to have a, a much greater competitive advantage when we're looking at um, attracting students that may look at schools that are much more expensive than us. Yeah. And for some reason, they think there's greater value there because the price tag is higher. Yeah. And that's absolutely not true. We know that this, the, the product that students get from a Pashi school is just as good as they can get from, say, a private institution. So I'm hearing a 3% bump in our enrollment and 7% in retention, or graduation rate. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But can I ask a question also? Um, Sorry, me? No, uh, well, this, this is also an unfair question, though. I'll just throw that in. Um, what, what, what is the role, like, what is the vision around the role that, um, advancement uh, fundraising uh, should play in, in addressing this issue. Uh, I, I, I mean, could we really ever conceive of um, uh, building significant endowment for the system um, that could actually put off, you know, uh, some reasonable amount in, in terms of a, you know, 5% income per year that could be applied, that, that the institutions could use for financial aid packages, et cetera. Or, or, yeah, exactly. But it, it, I guess, you know, but the, the vision and the role for developing that, as far as I'm concerned, very underdeveloped, but very potential-laden um, piece. 
I mean, just speaking specifically to our campus at Millersville, I would say that in the past two years, the relationship and the in the uh, the coordination that occurs between the enrollment management area and the advancement area is is we're, we are we are hand in hand partners in the work that we're doing because we know that we have to we have to do more to increase as much restri- unrestricted funds as we can to be able to lower that cro- uh, cost point for students. So I think absolutely that's a partnership that has to happen. Um, and I think that the donor sees the value added. If we can speak to the outcomes, I think that's the ultimate piece is to speak to the outcomes. And, and families will be able to probably be the ones that can give the best message. I think true stories about student success are the ones that will be able to open those doors for donors to look at maybe giving those gifts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Holistic advising. Holistic advising. Uh, We had a good session, even though it was a small group. Um, So strengths. We have a system that is willing to examine and reform advising, and I think that's a great thing. Um, Important discussions are happening at all the universities right now um, around (coughs) advising. And... What one thing we all came to agreement on is that advising has to be made more important. It has to be raised, uh, training faculty, training staff, uh, training everybody who has a role in advising to switch the mindset and the outcomes to everybody on campus is going to help these students graduate in four to six years, whether it's a bursar, whether it's a registrar, whether it's a faculty member or a staff member. That is our job. So that mindset, when we interview faculty for a job, do we ask them, how do you advise? That is something that needs to start coming from the top down in order to make this more important. Um, one of the, we looked at two, or I've been referencing two reports, uh, that were put out by, uh, BCG. One was for NASPA, and they talked about two important drivers to the success of holistic advising. And one of those is the use of action-oriented analytic and software tools. Uh, something like EAB or Starfish that can help with coordinating. Also, simplifying a student's path to a credential. And this is something we all discussed in various ways, whether that is an advising syllabus that some uh, schools here or some universities in the system are starting to use, really looking at those curriculum maps, improving our curriculum maps, Uh, We uh, mentioned many of the universities who have taken uh, advising reform very seriously, and these are some of the things they've done, and those are Oregon State, uh, Arizona State, University of Kansas, Iowa State, Michigan State, Ohio State, uh, Florida, and Georgia State. Many of these universities have demographics, very similar student demographics, very similar to ours. So um, by looking or researching at those schools, we can get even um, better ideas. Um, One suggestion that I hadn't heard of before that I thought was a a really good idea or something to consider, the idea of having a, a, a faculty dean who ushers one um, one class through four to six years to get them to that graduated uh, to that graduated level. So that one person who would be a faculty member um, would have that release time, and that person's job would be to usher those students through. This is a model that's been used at schools like uh, Wellesley. Now. It, Again, we have different students, so we would have to scale up or scale down, whether you are working with undeclared, whether you are working with students who um, are first generation and need different kinds of assistance. Um, What we're going to have to do in the future is really plan the vision for the future. That's what's next, Um, and also researching more and looking at the tools that the system is using and getting a better sense of what we're all doing. Any questions? I have a question. This is more to get the information, but what are the roadblocks that you see 
for implementing holistic advising? Um, we're going to have to have discussions uh, between the various unions to define the positions. Um, what a lot of schools do is with the onboarding of students, they might have a more what we call um, not an academic advisor, but someone who brings them on, looks after financial aid, those kinds of things, things that most faculty don't really want to do. And then you bring the faculty member on in the second year, so the faculty member starts to work with that student on their major, on their internships, on their research, the things that faculty are really good at doing. Um, again, one of the things we hear about, uh, we hear about great advisors. We hear about advisors who have in our system who have 300 students who they have to see. And then we hear about students who have had uh, inconsistent information given to them, where they've had to stay in school a little longer because they didn't get quite the right information at the right time. So I, I think that's another term we want to use is that right, term, right time, getting the right information at the right time for our students. So those schools that you mentioned, um, a bunch of them, Georgia State certainly, ASU, um, Florida definitely, you know, managed to pull off or at least to report seven to eight percent um, graduation rate improvements. Mm -hmm. Should we be targeting that level? Yes, we should be. And how long do you think that takes? Um, I, I'm going to be really honest. I think it would take at least five to six years. Um, these things don't happen quickly. Setting up new advising, it's a bit at a time. Um, yeah, it, it, it isn't. It isn't something that happens in a year. I wish it did. I kept looking. But we can get started. Yes, we have to get started. Is and I think one of the, the mapping is something that could happen right away. You know, some schools have it better, but that's something that we can improve right across the state. Is that some what, because it's not just a mechanical alignment of things, but a kind of a cultural change. I wasn't yes, hired to do it's a that. Cultural change. I was hired to do this, and now you're asking me to yes, also. Exactly. Is, it, is that part of the that's problem part of with it. implementation? Yeah, that's part of it. And also, there are different faculty who I've said are better at talking to students than others. You know, some uh, spent years in a lab all by themselves. They're not socially adept. And then we've got others who are. And they're the ones who end up with 300 students. So if I can, if I can just add, add into this, you know, I, Sam, I think you hit the nail on the head. That, that is the main. But if, you, if, if um, top leadership declares this to be important and sets the tone from the top um, and says things like, whoever ends up doing the advising and whether or not we can work that out, you know, with the, with the, with the faculty to professionalize it, or, you know, we continue with the system that we, we have based on the contractual agreement, um, that a few things happen like the right types of people are uh, assigned to do it in the first place, you know, not people who are more adept at research or right. something else, but, but actually, you know, you get the right people to do it in the first place. That's the quote, you know, hiring piece. Um, uh, that you you change the mindset as you were talking about, but you give an actual outcome. Mm -hmm. I mean, do, do we have the will to say performance evaluation is also now going to be looked at in terms of how many in your cohort that you're assigned to advise actually do graduate in four to six years. And so even in the professional uh, advising uh, centers, <coughs> assessment happens all the time. They do not work otherwise. Each visit is heavily assessed in the successful advising centers. One other thing, though, I've seen in the successful advising programs is that um, the faculty really do end up being brought on. It becomes a tangential relationship in that second year, and they, the professional advisor sort of steps back eventually, and it really does become that uh, faculty who, who ends up. So it isn't that they're separate. They have to work together for it to be successful. I, I think we're, we're talking, when we say holistic advising, we're just talking about a more holistic 
uh, way of assessing what the student needs to be successful. And I think some institutions call it uh, or have positions known as student success coaches, yeah. uh, sort of triage uh, the, the, the issues. Um, some institutions refer to it as case management, sort of borrowing from the healthcare mm -hmm. industry yes. where you have case case management, look at the patient and what it's going to take to make the patient well, and you have yeah. social work and you have the head nurse and you have... So uh, is this all the, you know, this all the same thing? Is it Similar different, other than... Different, different titles and slightly different approaches. No. We're looking at, you know, the mental health issues of the student, if they're on the, fo if they're on the football team, getting the coach of the football team in there, right. uh, getting the tutor in, you know. Uh, is that what it's we're talking about here? Coordination. Yeah, right. coordination of those services to enable success. For right. that. I think that's extremely important. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I heard you say that our students are similar to those at Georgia State, Michigan State. Not Michigan State. Not uh, Michigan, Georgia, Georgia State, State, Arizona yeah. State, you mentioned also, right? I, I didn't necessarily say similar, but Georgia yeah. State is very similar to the demographics of my institution. Your institution, but not necessarily all other uh, 14 and all other 13 campuses. I do. Th I think, and I, I like everything you say except that one. I think that uh, that to me seems uh, less relevant because Georgia State really made a difference in their retention rate. This th that's perhaps the only school I know that really eliminated the academic gap between African American and white students. Right. right. So, so what are we doing there? I mean, is, is, are you thinking about this one, or I know you have a group. Did the group think about the difference in terms of? Uh, uh, minority status. And oh, definitely. That's one of the main drivers behind, I think, this push or this reform in advising is um, that if you want to call it a social justice issue or we have students who we need to make sure they are successful and they need different support or more support. So in, in other ways, uh, an honor student is going to need a different type of support. And, and a student who is underserved is going to need another type of support. So that's why it's difficult to say it's a blanket. Yeah. It, it, you right. can't make a blanket sort of fix all. It, it's got to be adaptable. It's tricky. There's no, it's not easy. <laughs> Thanks. So Georgia State was successful in the incorporation of artificial intelligence in, in a lot of their efforts. And they brought it to scale through those efforts. And so it took away from a bunch of the hands-on, mm -hmm. um, except where needed, and to guide and advise. Are you suggesting that the system invest in such technology in conjunction with a central student information system? I think it's something that really needs to be researched. Thank you very much. Okay. Before she sets, before she sets down, I, I do want to say a couple things because I think you can tell Dr. Ball is very passionate about students and she is a tremendous teacher. She is also passionate about the performing arts and has done phenomenal work with our musical theater department and she's also a very talented administrator having ser served as chair of her department and also as the assistant dean of the College <laughs> of Arts and Sciences and she is leaving us to go to the uh, count. County College of Morris as their Dean of Liberal Arts. And she, no matter how hard I have tried to convince her to stay, <laughs> she will be in New Jersey. I'm going to miss you all. Before I report out on my group, I have to give up a little bit of my time just to point out since Georgia State came up so much that it's important to realize that they hired over 30 full-time professionals to raise those numbers. So that was a big investment that they, they took on. So, um, but we talked about mental health. I shared some national data. I didn't share HASHI data because we don't have it. So that's really an opportunity that we need to look on. And, and as we think about this topic, which is different from financial aid and affordability, this is really a leading edge topic. In higher education, we've only really been talking about this for three, maybe five years at most in terms of the mental health issues of students and the impact it's having. Whereas if you look at financial aid research, people have been doing that for decades. And so um, while there is national data, we haven't necessarily pulled PASHI data together 
in a unified way. And so that's an opportunity that we have and we've got to focus on. We also, uh, we spent a lot of time talking about culture and contract, um, meaning the recognition of uh, our counselors as faculty um, in the system and that that's a reality that we've got, we've got to take into mind. Um, some of the strengths we talked about were um, doing campaigns with students to erase the stigma, build wellness, build resilience, those types of things. Uh, early alert systems, which many of our campuses already have and employ, but probably all of them have some sort of form of early alert system to identify students and utilize faculty and staff to bring those students forward. <coughs> and then uh, another strength is connections to community services and agencies. So uh, many of our campuses, most likely all of them, have strong relationships with agencies in the county or um, local agencies that they can connect students with. And that really is an important piece of it that it cannot all be shouldered by the institution. It has to be shouldered by the county, by the local agencies as well um, to take care of. Um, some opportunities, we talked about training, um, training for students, faculty, and staff. Um, so being aware of issues, noticing signs, being able to connect students who need it to the right resources. We also talked about data analytics. Are there data analytics that can be brought to bear to help us identify students who may, may need early intervention. Um, and I included that because that's been thought about from an academic standpoint and done well. Um, we do it on many of our campuses, but we haven't really been doing that necessarily from a mental health perspective. I don't know what that looks like, but I thought it was an interesting point. Um, what are we missing? Um, this goes to that sort of culture piece. We need to have a broader conversation on counseling approaches. Um, we, we generally have a very univariate mindset um, with counseling, so uh, be, because we look at it as a faculty role, um, often uh, departments are searching for other PhDs that look like themselves, which actually impacts the diversity of approaches from a counseling standpoint. Um, so what are we doing to bring in other mindsets to help serve our students, and how does that best fit the students where they are, depending on their socioeconomic status, racial background, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and though I said it was, it was definitely a strength, we certainly can be doing more to engage off-campus services for our students and bringing them onto campus. That's what we talked about. Any questions? I know it was a pretty active discussion in the room. Pretty thorough. I, I guess... Uh... <coughs> Along the lines of um, unanswerable questions that you know Dan has started, unfair, whatever. Um, are we really ever going to be able to get our arms around this? I mean, it just seems to me that um, uh, I mean anything we can do is good. Everything you've outlined is good, but this is um, this is a problem that might be truly beyond the capability, um, or even to some extent the mission, um, right? for, I, I don't know, I'm just throwing it out there. I think, I think it's a fair question. And I would respond with this. It is a societal problem. We know that it's a societal problem. But at the same time, these are the students that are coming to our door. So if we wanna boost retention to the students that are coming through our doors, we've gotta do something. Uh, we are not gonna solve this issue, certainly. But are there things that we can do to catch students early, to connect them to supports, so that they can be uh, ushered through the system. In the same way that with financial aid and affordability, the story that, that Brian shared, they were able to catch a student, get her connected, and get her connected to appropriate scholarships, et cetera, for her to go on and be successful. We have to employ the same um, mindset to mental health. Are we going to um, retain every single student who is facing some of these difficult challenges? No. Um, but we need to do what we can to retain as many as we can. That's my perspective. Fair enough, and I think that's excellent. Thank you. And, and can I ask, and, and others, <coughs> not, not just to, I'm just curious, but and others feel free to chime in. I'm, this is, I mean, you're right, higher ed has really been, it, it, this has been a conversation for a while, but it's really ramped up, obviously, in the last three to five years. Um, which makes me wonder, is this an area where external funders, whether national or philanthropic, are investing in um, you know, early stage innovation, what I would call early stage, you know, what do we do to, meet, to solve this problem? In the way that they're probably investing less so in things like developmental education and advising because the evidence base under the practices we've discussed here is 
pretty good. And so you see funders pulling away from the innovation space. Are, you, are we seeing funders pour into the health and wellness, what works here arena? Do you know? Um, I, I have not seen it, but sir, I know you've done some work with the Yeah, uh, there's some. It's, it's hard to put cause and effect. Yeah. And so I think that's the challenge. There's a lot more in the K-12 space under bullying, yeah. Yeah. which falls under the um, mental health yeah. type and health and wellness um, rubric. But um, there's, as far, I mean, in the research that we've done, we have a few, we have three or four that are under um, health and wellness, but not a lot. Yeah. Whether it's growing or not, I don't know. I don't have longitudinal data. I know that the conversation is there, and all of the um, think tanks are looking at it. Yeah. But. Thank you very much. One last word, maybe on uh, mental health and well-being. It's it's an issue we are focused on at, at Lock Haven very much. So we have a working group uh, looking at how we can remove the stigma, create more awareness about the services we already have. Not so much investing more, but letting people know about what we have already and removing the stigma uh, from coming forward and asking for help. In addition to looking at funders, I, I think it would be great to look at um, where are the innovations in this area and are they working? For example, some institutions um, do um, uh, mandatory screenings for freshmen you know, to create some kind of baseline of mental health and well-being for the student. We're actually doing that with athletes and considering doing it on a larger scale. But we don't know if it works. So if there's a way to, to find out what, the, you know, what and assess what the latest innovations are in this area and their efficacy, I think it would be very, very helpful to us. All right. Save the best for last. <laughs> of course. No, and I stand between you and that wine. Well, it's really you stand between our students and their jobs. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's the thing. We'll stay here all night long then. Uh, wine's fine. <laughs> So our conversation, yeah, for, you know, that's, um, that's why we're here. <laughs> that's right. We'll, uh, we talked from a framework of um, three or four tenets. One, I mean, we, we kept in mind academic uh, preparedness, degrees, certificates, credential, upskill, reskill, things of that nature. Um, the other component is a diversity lens looking at um, um, when we look at state data and the students who are completing degrees at higher rates than those who are not, those students who are Latino and African American aren't attaining degrees at the same level of uh, white students. Um, and we also chatted well, about essential skills or non-academic uh, skills and competencies, and those are the kinds of skills that cut across all industries, as I talked before uh, when I read that, that piece about the student on, on um, who was upskilling his, his, his uh, credentials. And the other thing that was brought up is the fact that we have to be mindful that in the next five years, 20% of the blue and gray collar workforce will be, those jobs will be gone. Uh, and how do we um, capture that? What do we need to do to make certain that we're preparing students um, um, to, to be able to enter the workforce? And finally, we all have seen statistics about students with advanced degrees have the potential to make up, up, up to the amount of a million dollars or more than those who are not um, prepared with advanced degrees. From that, we looked at strengths. And my, my colleagues who were in the room, and we've got, I've got a support person over here to kind of not really support, but a, a guiding person in case I make a mistake. Uh, but... We talked about strengths. Uh, our program, our <coughs> colleges have a suite of programs that we offer across um, um, Pennsylvania. A uh, broad perspective and a broad um, opportunity, again, to serve many students because of our geographic distribution. Another strength is access and affordability. Access and affordability also was an opportunity because we said, although we're doing well, there's some opportunities to do better. Um, opportunities, again, affordable and access. I think one of the things that we talked about, I, I think, is, is really important. And some of you, many of you know about the whole growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. And the conversation really was about how do we teach students to understand that failure is not meaning that all is lost. If you fail, I've often heard the chancellor say, fail, fail fast but then learn from that. And so how can we help our students learn that 
A failure does, a mistake does not mean that all is lost. We talked quite a bit about, um, yes, we talked quite a bit about articulation agreements with community colleges. <laughs> Need I say more? Um, and one, one statistic was that uh, we're only capturing 10% of the community college students in the state. And while um, there was something else that just recently happened, that doesn't mean that we don't have the opportunity yet still to go after some of those students and really work um, significantly to create articulation agreements across the state so that we can <laughs> grab our fair share of those students. Uh, and, and being nimble and looking at online programs for undergraduate students. And we do a great deal of programs for graduate students, but are there some opportunities with the online, on, on, online for undergraduate students? Building better relationships with our local communities. Um, stackable degrees and creden credentialing. And the example that Sarah used about uh, her lifelong learning skill set and getting credit for that. Are we doing that uh, on college campuses? And to what degree and how effective are we managing that? Um, opportunities. Opportunities. Um, let me see. We have to start looking at the reciprocal relationship that universities have with their local communities. The university is an economic uh, driver for the community, but the community can also be a driver for the university. That it's just not a one-off, but it is, it is a, a relationship that we have to take advantage of. And Kate, I'm gonna need you on this one. Oh. The, the problem is my handwriting. I wasn't, gonna, I, I wasn't gonna, gonna, gonna say, say that. that. What was your question? Oh, that, that our system may not be set up for workforce. Um, so we know that, that, that you know, we have evidence of, of collecting data and using data around, re around retention, persistence, and graduation. But we mentioned today some of the metrics that we're just not quite yet capturing. And so is that reflective of the system as a whole not being set up for workforce? And some, and some campuses are doing, doing, doing a great job with um, being able to uh, bring a student in and provide them with skills uh, to, to allow them to go right into the workforce with associate degrees and credentials and other institutions aren't. So um, that might be an opportunity to look at how that works across the system. What is surprising is that we don't have the support for workforce readiness from the government. Um, and I think you wrote this one. So am I, uh, you, Sharon, you wrote this one. So I'm trying to make sure I deciphered that right. But we don't have the support the from a system level. Funding. 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 Funding, yes. And then, um, let's see. Oh, yes. Why aren't we setting ourselves up in such a way that as a system, employers are saying, we want PASHI students because they have this skill set or because we're known for one thing. You know, some industries are coming, but, but why, isn't it, why isn't that we have the opportunity, I think, um, it's surprising that we're not in a position where employers are saying we want PASHI students across the board because consistently they possess this skill competency, knowledge base, or what have you. And then what's missing, a lack of integration of industry and university. Um, we, had a, we, had a, we had a really good conversation about being an engaged citizen. Uh, it's one thing to say I'm going to college to get a job. It's another thing to say I'm prepared to talk globally about issues uh, across the board. So how, how, how are we preparing students um, to be global citizens? And then the system connecting to the industry across, across universities, right? All right. That's it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. So I ju I'm just, uh, I I'm wondering if um, this might be another place where looking at um, the development function uh, and, uh, and this comes together. So saying to, you know, we have uh, uh, any number of, um, 
And I think actually, Aaron, uh, you're doing this at Cheney, where you're looking at uh, corporations who, uh, you know, have an interest that you're cultivating, uh, you know, as donors or corporate sponsors or whatever. Um, at the same time, the financial support is great. Also saying, and we would love it if you would make a commitment to offer X number uh, of internships or X number of jobs and come to our campus and recruit, you know, uh, for those jobs so that you're sort of combining workforce development with, um, with, with uh, you know, financial cultivation. Um, right. And, you know, creating a deeper bond and a more sort of reciprocal. They're getting something. And that also, I think, gets to the issue of then companies, they, 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 they have our students for internships or what have you and start to say, you know what? This is a great product yeah. that you've got. It it, it gets at, at that issue also getting getting that word out, that branding out. I think that's a that's a real opportunity for funding when you start talking about you know many of our colleges, their local companies are saying we want your students for these reasons, and so then you know there's a, there's some opportunity for them to help us in meaningful ways. Yeah. The that, one other just go ahead. One other point we talked about, very often we get into this fight um, um, about either it's workforce development, which people sometimes go to the ledge of vocational training, or and or liberal arts education, and just to learn, to, to develop habits of mind. Uh, it's both. And we need as a system to look at all of our students, whatever level of entry they come in, in preparation, if they come in to complete a two-year degree or they have a two-year degree and they want to get advanced training in management, they need to have the education to be able to have global conversations and advance in industry. Uh, we see that at Clarion because we have entry level, we have two-year degrees, four-year degrees, and we have all the way to the shared doctoral program. So we see all of those differences with our students, and truly not everyone's going to be an industry leader and a global thinker. Some people will be wonderful head nurses working in an emergency room saving lives, and that's, and that's what they will do. So it varies uh, from place to place, and I think that the system, we have pockets of that, and we have strengths, and we can meet the needs of our adult learners, but we should be a little more systematic about it. Yep. And if I can make a quick comment about uh, the last statement that Chair, uh, Chairwoman uh, about and that you see the foundation in partnership with the corporate world. Coming from a small liberal arts university that basically depended totally on their own resources, it's a culture and it's a machinery that needs to be built. And at the moment, when I look, at least just looking at Millersville, we don't have it. That's what I've been working on. We have 70,000 plus alums. When I arrived, we were engaged with 3.9%. We've been able to take it up to 2%. But if you think about that, um, as if you look at the future, one of the biggest advantages we have as a system and as, as our schools is to start thinking like a quasi-public instead of just being a public institution. Because we know it's very clear that the sort of things we want to do, everything we're talking about here now requires resources. And so we have to start thinking in a more entrepreneurial way, as our chancellor has been saying, that we can't expect to get all our resources from one source. And what you said to me is like music, that we have to start thinking that way and the president's behaving that way. Um, question. Um, Randy sends us articles from time to time that people in my world wouldn't normally read. So we get a little bit of information and makes us dangerous. Um, on the workforce development, and I view that as being kind of reactive to what the future workforce demands are, it, it seems to me that, that, that there's at least a perception, I'll put it, I have a perception, that, that one of the barriers is our uh, inability to adjust programming, you know, the, the actual you know, uh, curriculum uh, quickly, like that we're a little too deliberative and maybe overly overanalyze what we're going to change to to offer what that future workforce demand might be is that is that a factor is that something that we should 
you know, try to address? Is there a return on that investment of speeding up our ability to respond? It's actually something I think the community colleges do very you know, well. occasionally eat our lunch over yeah. as, you know, in a comparative sense, because it seems like they can turn on a dime to react to a, That's right. a workforce demand. We had a great conversation about being nimble. We offer an example that we talked about um, that um, relates to your observation. So um, providing credit for life experience, right? There's, there are local processes to analyze life experience <coughs> and equivalent credit. Um, those are very local, meaning down to the department level decisions, you know. Um, it took us a year to approve uh, life experience credit for police academy training uh, in order to help to incent uh, our associate degree in criminal justice. Um, that's too long, you know. So that's an example of we're not nimble enough, you know. So we need to figure out ways to create more nimbleness and, and, and to be able to make decisions like that quicker while respecting you know, local faculty prerogative and so forth, but it can't take a year to do that. We need to be able to respond quicker than that. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your engagement. Uh, this was a lot of information and we really appreciate everyone putting in the time to do this. Um, it's an extensive dialogue and I think we'll have a lot more back to you. Sarah, thank you to your new team. Um, this is a great project. Um, thank you all for allowing me the opportunity of taking up all of our time today with my committee meeting. <laughs> and I finished right on time. Um, I do have a uh, note, which is everyone is invited to the, um, what is called the McCormick House. My house. Some of you may know that as the Chancellor's residence, um, but I believe it is not the current Chancellor's residence. So we call it the McCormick House uh, for cocktails and uh, light hors d'oeuvres provided by someone. Um, so on that, Madam Chair, may I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. And just a reminder that we reconvene, just a reminder that we reconvene at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. Thank you all. So I want to thank you all for the work, too. And I, I, I hope this input now gets moved forward and, you know, we get these recommendations on all this stuff. We go. Okay, meeting adjourned for now.